All right, we're live. Man, I always get so nervous before these things, guys. I don't know what to do. Oh, crap, we're on air. Hey, guys, what's going on? Welcome to Caliber Corner number 61. Man, we are just racking up the episodes right now. We've already got a very active chat going on on the YouTube side. Looks like we've uh, see we got some people over the Gun Channel side that showed up this morning. Yes, we do. We got Paper Plane Crash over there and Patrick's over there. Hey, let's go ahead and just go and do a, attendance early here. We're starting on time today. Uh, two live moves, the first person to show up. Good morning, sir. Midnight Range TM is out there. The other Travis, Ozzy uh, Orsborne is out there. Uh, tacos and French fries is in the house. I'm sure we'll have a lot more people showing up to class with the past because they're late. That's all right. We're going to go ahead and start anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and let the panel introduce themselves, and then we'll talk about the topics for today, and maybe we'll have a few more panelists uh, show up. The links are out there. So, Squib, we'll start off with you. Hey, so what is new in your world, Squib? What's going on? You busy man this um, morning? Uh, I don't know. It's a rainy day, so yeah. I haven't figured out what uh, what the agenda is going to be. But uh, I'm sure the, there'll be something involved in my Henry rifle. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Make sure you got it ready to go because we're going to do some show and tell if you can. <laughs> um, you know, Squib, I, I sometimes think we must be in the same latitude because I think we get the same weather as you guys, the same snow or what we get. You guys get it a week later. What you get, we get it a week later. So I feel your pain, man. It's getting chilly oh, yeah, out there. Yeah. It's getting cold out, talking, man. Talking to you, I, I, talking to you, I get a, a better uh, prediction than yeah. watching the weather channel. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. Man, tell you what. So, all right, so Squib, if people want to find you, where can they find you online? Do you have a, do you have a channel on YouTube? Where do you tend to hang out? What's what's your what's your go-to? Well, I tend to hang out on shows like this because I'm a weasel. <laughs> I, I pop into shows all week long. No, and, uh, you're a contributing I, I appreciate... panelist. You're a contributing panelist. You got to be positive about it. Come on, man. Eh, not not me. <laughs> I, what? I'm Mr. Pessimist. Uh, but uh, yeah, I appreciate the invite from you and everybody else during the week because I like doing shows and. Uh, other people's shows, that is. And uh, I do have a channel. Uh, it's got a bunch of lame videos on there. They're not all firearms <laughs> related because uh, you know, that's just, just my thing. But uh, recently I did a video where I uh, tested Pyrodex X and Black Powder in one of my percussion revolvers. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that's been done. It's, I even referenced somebody who does a much better job of that sort of test <laughs> in my video. Okay. Uh, because I, I do recommend going to his channel, but uh, yeah, um, I've got I've got more stuff coming. It's just how much time I I make to do uh, edits. So yeah, I gotta move one of my firearms around here. No, dude, I hear you, man. It does take up a lot of time. I uh, posted a video at uh, <laughs> one a.m. this morning on Patreon. I took the Christensen Arms Model Fourteen Ridgeline out yesterday. I did not want to leave the range. I was absorbing every minute that I was out there, and it takes time, man. I put that video up about one o'clock this morning. And I was like, you know what? I got to get some sleep. But anyway, Squib, you're here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hopefully going to come to you for some advice on uh, lever guns. We're going to call them lever guns. You can call them lever guns if you want to. I don't care, but we're not going to, we don't need to debate it. I don't think, but so Squib, make sure you got some, uh, some, some toys a, on standby. Yeah. It's a lever action lever gun. Ah, there we go. We just like it. Now. All right. Just like it's an M1 Garand <laughs> made by John Garand. Yes, so, yes. A lot of people call them Grand instead of Garand, you know, the M1 Grand, you know. Yeah, it, I've always called it an M1 Grand. I always yeah. will call it an M1 Grand, but the man's last name is Garand. Yes, It's yes. like, why change now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, man. We're going we're gonna to take things back a little bit here. Tony, Tony, Tony's in the house. Tony, 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 what's going on, man? How you doing, brother? I forgot it was Saturday. <laughs> Whoa, okay, you might want to get that checked out, man. No, I'm just messing with you. So, Tony, what what's new in your world, man? You still out hunting? You still out getting out there in the out in the nature? What are you doing, buddy? Uh, not this weekend because it's youth oh. deer season, and I won't oh. go to the woods. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, man. So, what's new in your world, man? What do you what do you got going on these days? Nothing. All right. Well, um, Tony, we hope you can contribute to today's chat. We're going to start off talking about some lever guns. I think it's going to be a fun time. Uh, you might be an authority on that. I don't know. I'm expecting you to maybe chime in a little bit. So uh, pressure's on, Tony. I'm not a, an authority on anything. Oh, come on, man. With age comes wisdom, brother. And on that note, let's move over to uh, Sandhills. Sandhills, what's going on, man? How you doing? Good morning. I'm good. Thanks for the invite. Cool, cool, cool. So what's going on, man? What's new in your world, buddy? What do you got going on? Oh, uh, you know, just uh, doing that thing we do and yeah, and uh, running some errands this morning, so I'll be kind of in and out a little bit this morning. Cool, but uh, should be 
should be around for most of the chat. Well, I want to give you a heads up. I'm going to be siding a few uh, firearms here for deer season. I don't know what I'm going to bring with me when I when we go do our little shoot in January. So uh, I'm bring really that, gonna... bring that Christensen. <sighs> that stands. He's going to have it. Unfortunately, I won't be able to as much as I want to. He probably would if I asked, but I don't know if he's going to go out in January. Um, you know, he'd it's... probably let you take that back out and do a do an actual field review of it. Oh yeah, it was it was yeah. To actually, what it's like to actually carry the thing, take it out there. I'd be afraid I'd fall or something and break it. Oh man. Um, no, I'll probably take the Ruger Ranch. I've also got the thirty thirty, and uh, you know, we'll have some fun. Who knows? Maybe I'll pick something else up before then. You never know. Yeah. Just bring everything because you know we might go find a target somewhere. Mm hmm. There we go. So, question for you, Sand Hills. Uh, your show two A Tuesdays is that going to be a, a weekly a weekly item a bi weekly? What, what's the plan? We're we're planning on going weekly. Um, if it's if there's a night that it's not going to work, I'll be sure and let people know. But we're figuring on it. Cool, cool, cool. So, guys, if you want to check it out, that is uh, Tuesday nights at we going for ten o'clock central, nine o'clock central. What it's pretty much whenever hit or miss Tuesday nights nine o'clock uh, Eastern time, eight o'clock central time. The only time zone that matters gets done, right? Right, exactly. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll start it up a little bit before hit or miss, but okay, okay, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys ever see me ducking out of hit or miss early, it's because I'm heading over to Sand Hills so we can get ourselves ready to rock, which is bad because I feel like I'm cheating on Night Strike, but you know. Hey, Night Strike, what's going on, brother? How you doing, man? You bastard! Love you too. So what's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, I'm awake. I've got coffee. I've got bear claws. Uh, I, I'm ready to, you know, take on the world today. Bear claws. You didn't share, man. You know what? Maybe I'll do some. Maybe I'll do some tasty cake consumption next Saturday on our episode. I don't know. It's well, they're, they're Walmart. They're Walmart bear claws. Uh, so. Dude, any any bear claws are good bear claws. So. though. But, but again, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm here. Uh, hit or miss Tuesday nights at nine o'clock. Thank you for the plug, even if you're cheating on me. You know, uh, don't worry. Sure. I'll tell I'll tell Smeggy. And uh, yeah, hey, <laughs> you know, we, we got this new platform called GunTube. Yes, Let's check it out. Yes. Yeah, man. So, so what is GunTube? What can one what can one expect to find if they come on over to GunTube? Can they find some Bollywood videos? No. Hmm. Why not? The only the only videos uh, you will find on GunTube are gun videos. Yes. And yes. and maybe some of Midnight Range TM's cooking videos because we can't stop him from uploading those. No, videos. you can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him. Uh yeah. So when it comes to GunTube, there's some live podcasting available. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, now what about like, okay, in terms of, of keeping GunTube going, this is not cheap because you're basically bankrolling it yourself. How I'm can one, how can, how can one support, how can we support GunTube? What, what can we do for you, Night Strike? That's a question I would ask. Well, you can go, we have uh, affiliate le links and ads on GunTube mm -hmm. already now. So if you click on those links, like say if you need to buy AR parts from PSA, buy them from PSA. If you need to buy parts from Brownells. Buy them from Brownells, but use the links on GunTube.org because it helps GunTube generate a little cash to pay the server bills because they're not cheap. Yeah, now you had said that uh, recently there's kind of a bonus for people that are having people purchase items through their website. You can get a little bit more money this month. Is that right? Yeah. There's a little bit more that comes back to you people purchase through the website. So here's the deal, guys. If you're going to go buy something on PSA or, or Brownells, right, and, you know, they've got these Black Friday specials. They're probably going to start up here towards the end of October. All you got to do is get the SKU number or get the item number from that that page when you open it up and you're viewing the item. Cut and paste that back in the search box on the Brownells or the PSA website, and you can buy it through GunTube.org, and then a cut of it will go to GunTube.org to keep the, 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 the website going, okay, to keep purchasing storage space and so on. So it's easy to support, especially those of you guys you know, you spend $400, $500, $300 on PSA or whatever. Um, just make the purchases through through the through the affiliate links, and I start and get a cut of that. Yeah, because it's hosting GunTube is not cheap. No, no, I know it's not. I mean, it just takes up you know it takes up space, and there's there's fees and all this other stuff. And bandwidth. And bandwidth is the, the major thing. The, the the main thing people need to understand is that you're not doing this through ad through AdSense because when you try to go through Google AdSense, Google basically uh, cuts you off for monetization of your website because of content that was featured on the website itself, even though it's your website. Um, you're not and breaking any rules. They're basically your content it. or it's viewer content. And yeah. it, though I, I will say it's it didn't help that G Webs watched the whole Red Dawn video and contrasted it with the you with know, the new Red Dawn video. But again, you know, he was reviewing it and he was commenting on it. So it would fall under the the, the fair use, even though it's the full movie, it would 
fall under fair use because he was commenting on it the entire time. Okay, and, okay. And, and YouTube still wouldn't, YouTube, Google, AdSense, everything, they would say, no, that's copyright material. You got to take that off. And if you don't take that off, it won't give you your mad sense. And I'm like, well, then I guess you can go to hell. Yeah, you know, and still so the fact that they want to impose basically their, their non-monetization rules, uh, you know, on a website and not YouTube itself kind of blew my mind that they would even try that. So, oh, man, tell you what. Uh, all right, man. So we're going to kind of keep things rolling. We're going to, we're going to definitely, uh, keep going to going. So make sure you get over there, upload your videos, get yourself signed up, share and so on. So nice strike. Thanks for joining us. David, what's going on, man? David Bowling in the house. What, what is new in your world, brother? Henry. Oh, is that too soon? That's the answer to your argument for lever guns. That's it. Just, <laughs> just Henry. Just Henry. No, I'm, I'm yeah, doing Marlon. good, man. I appreciate the, uh, Ooh, appreciate Marlon, the shots fired. Yeah, so uh, what's coming up on your channel, David? What's new? What do you got going on, man? Uh, I have a couple different uh, rifle reviews come out this week. Probably looking for two or three rifle reviews this week. And then uh, whatever else might come up. Uh, I got a couple other things I'm thinking about, but it just depends on weather and timing. Yeah, yeah. And again, you guys, check out David Bowling's channel. There's a lot of cool content over there. He does some neat shooting videos, some neat range videos, a lot of just kind of kind of out of the box accuracy videos, which is kind of nice because you know a lot of times you'll watch a YouTube video and these people don't miss and they shoot these perfect groups and you know they're like, oh yeah, it's a sub sub MOA rifle or whatever, you know. And not Obviously, that these people can't, can't watch pull it night out. strike videos. Well, no, then I was going to say, then there's those of us that keep it real, those of us that have the guns and malfunction, those of us that shoot the three inch groups, those of us because you might be shocked at how. This thing shoots great, but it, not in my hands. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it shot good, but I was, I wanted like. Please tell us more time. about this. We, we need to see pictures. Oh, the video's on Patreon. You can watch it. I posted it at one thirty this morning. Ah, uh, I gotta do it. It's there for you. Oh no, I'm talking like a one inch group at three hundred yards. It was fine, but I wanted, you know, I wanted like bullet hole through bullet hole accuracy on this thing. I wanted to find, you know, but uh, a little more practice, I could probably accomplish that. But it's, it's, it's a, it's a fun, it's a very fun rifle. I was chambered at six five Creedmoor. After Caliber Corner, I want to talk to you a bit more about gun tube for oh, the off cool. air, the yeah. off air talk. That's fine, man. That's fine. A lot of you don't realize this. Our little post chats go for hours sometimes. We need to just turn the camera back on and do just the post chat chat. I think that'd be pretty cool. Well, uh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm working on some stuff in the background, and I'm hoping that it will work out. And I want yeah. to, you know, be able to offer a bit more than what YouTube does for. Yeah. Yeah. People. Oh yeah. Hey, uh, guys, we got a few more people join us on the uh, YouTube side. I just checked the gun channel side. We got the same crew over there. Scott P79 is with us on the YouTube side. E Rock is with us. Good morning, sir. John Brown Productions in the house. Calibers 32 SPCL special in the house, everybody. Uh, Marlon Leverguns is what he says. Harris Skinner, morning, y'all from Dallas, Texas. Harris, how you doing, man? Go get yourself some uh, Whataburger this morning. I will be jealous of you all day. Stephen Dawkins in the house. Blue Steel 44. What's going on, man? Tacos and French Fries is joining us. Vandals joining us. Uh, leave her action, uh, Vandal. I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna leave that up to. I'm gonna leave her that up to you. Uh, BB61 in the house. Hey, what's going on, brother? Samson once joining us. Cadillac Jack WB, and then we're back to Midnight Range TM. So I think that's everybody that's with us now. So let's go and start this off. I let Tony, me go ahead. Yeah. clarify the lever lever thing. Oh, here when we you're go. Building a freaking house. Do you yes. use your lever to make it straight? No. Or do you use a level? You use it's a level. Lever. Yes. Lever. No, I'm not. I'm not going to call it a lever at all. I mean, uh, the only lever I know is that like lever 2000 soap. And I think that's where a lot of people think that uh, lever needs to be pronounced lever. So that or is a Yankee Marshall. He's pretty adamant about calling it a lever gun. I don't know. Maybe. So the idea of the lever action rifle. Okay. It's time for just a little bit of show and tell. I want to show mine off real quick. If you guys got one you want to show off, feel free to do so. So what I got here. No worries, clear. Marlin 336 CS. Okay, nothing too crazy. I saw this sitting in SS Pond two years ago in December. Fell in love with it. It does have a, a Weaver brand scope on the top. It's really old, but it, it is accurate. Um, it shoots the uh, Remington core locked ammo, 170 grain, 30-30 round. What awesome. scope? It shoots it well. This is the, it's a Weaver brand, and it is a 3 to 9, probably 3 by 9 by 40, I'm guessing. 
and it does have the what is it the parallax adjustment in the front your your yardage adjustment in the front so it goes nice. <laughs> it goes from it goes from 50 to 1000 yards which i don't know how you'd ever i mean maybe i guess with the right gun you can make it happen but i saw this thing in the in the pawn shop man i just, i had to have it it's just it's awesome nice and smooth does not like the ppu ammunition we've talked about that before i think uh, ppu brass is really thin so it has a tendency to maybe over expand a smidge just get and, uh, a white box ooh. Yeah, I, I did run that through it. I did an ammo test where I ran like five different brands of ammo through it. And uh, it liked the core lock the best. That was the most accurate ammo. I want to take it back out again, though, because I haven't shot it for probably probably a year and a half now. It's just been sitting in the back, so I've been testing so many other guns. But, you know, I like the iron sights are on there, and I could take the rail off if I needed to. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the scope's got yeah. kind of that. It's kind of an oval-shaped rear. I'm going to call it an aperture or whatever in the back of it. So, so that's what I got. This is a 1991 model of this damn JM. And uh, I basically paid, I'm not going to lie, I basically paid what it would cost me for a new Marlin um, from the pawn shop, but that was with the uh, with the scope, and I wanted to get the pre-Freedom Group guns, which, you know, we can argue about that, too. I, there was a time, you know, when Freedom Group had purchased uh, Marlin, and then they moved the factory. I don't know if it's on the Remington grounds. They went from wherever they were to New York. For a while there, they kept some of the original gunsmiths around, and I was told it was new people that took over the process of making the, the 336s. And then for a while there, there were some problems with the guns. And I don't know. Now, I mean, I see the 336s sitting in the in the rifle. Our Walmart sells rifles, and they're sitting there in the little turning stand that you can, you know, make it go around in a circle. And uh, the 336s look fine. I mean, if you want one, you know, they've got kind of a blackened finish. It doesn't really look blued. Or maybe this one's, the patina on this one's just so worn that that's what it started lo out looking like is how they look in the case. But um, so what do you guys think about lever guns in general? What's What are your thoughts on it? Are they... Are they outdated? Are they are they still a viable firearm? I, I have no doubt that they're still incredibly useful. What do you guys think about it? What are your thoughts on them? I think that I they're the coolest guns out there. Uh, I, I'm definitely going to buy one for a collector piece for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, this to me, just the when you stand there and look back at it, it's the most beautiful gun you could look at, and the. The little loading port on the side mm -hmm. of the of the receiver. Yep. That ever since I was a kid, I thought that that was the coolest way to load a gun ever. I mean, just, just look at that. How is that not the most beautiful gun you've ever seen? It is awesome. This one does have the cross bolt safety. I know a lot of guys like to get them either without or if there was some other type of safety they used at some point. Uh, that's just basically I think so you could safely lower the hammer and unload it without having to go off. This one does have the little knob on the side here. On the uh, on the hammer back there, so you can easily set it to however you want. Uh, it's interesting. Mine's set off to the right, though. I guess it should be. But anyway, no, yeah. So I mean, they're just and this one. It's kind of hard to tell on the camera. But this kind of has that old antique kind of finish to it. It's just it's been worn. It's got it's got holster wear on it from well scabbard wear, whatever you want to call it, from being in some sort of a case. I don't know if the prior owner kept it maybe on an ATV or heck where we are. I mean, it's ranch country. This could have been used on horseback too. It's got. A lot of wear on the top of the scope so it was in some sort of a case and it was fired quite a bit i've completely taken it apart and cleaned it and it cleans up nice um part of me and i know this would be completely sacrilegious but part of me would like to put black synthetic stocks on it i think that would look kind of cool and i just it's because i want to protect the wood make it a little damage. lighter yeah and i don't know if that would affect you know stability or recoil perceived recoil because it well no, no it's stability it's pretty good it's, so. it's still made out of steel It'll, yeah. it'll be fine with stability. Just, you're you're going to have some weight that's going to come off of it, though. Gonna, yeah, yeah. So not probably much. would like to put that not on there. Like. not going to get rid of the wood stocks, but, I mean, I would just uh, swap it out so I can beat those up a little bit, not to worry about messing up the wood. But the wood on these things, right. it's like 25 years old plus. So, yeah. Uh, so, go ahead, Tony. According to an article that I read here about six months ago, that could affect the accuracy because the forearm is kind of important in the accuracy on those. I don't know if that's true or not, but I assume that there was some basis of fact behind it. Would it be less accurate because of the flimsiness of the plastic versus the, the rigidity of, of wood or not? What do you think, Tony? Uh, I would, if that's what they're talking about, yeah, I would say it would be less accurate because that plastic can be more prone to move. No, it's, that's true. That's true. I never thought about that. Um, there's And there's only one or two companies. Well, there's a lot of aftermarket companies. You can spend as much on stocks <laughs> you can spend half the value of the gun on the wood stocks alone if you go online and look up custom stocks for that thing you can do whatever you want yeah, to those things so marlin makes them so mm -hmm. yeah marlin makes the 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 polymer stocks for it, if i'm not mistaken they're like 65 dollars on ebay or 70 bucks for a set or something like that when you look them up yeah 
So, oh, go ahead, Dave, Travis. Go, go ahead. What's that? I got some trivia for you. Oh, man. Go ahead. I'm not a lever gun knowledge guy. What, yeah. <laughs> what, company, what company made the first true lever gun? Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. lever, lever, I lever. Uh, Winchester. Volcanic. Volcanic. Ah. So originally, originally 3030 then? I mean, that was well, the original. Uh, uh, no, it was originally no, no, that's no. not correct. That's uh -oh. not correct. Uh-oh. Col Colt did make a lever ring gun, but I'm talking lever gun as in what we see today. Okay. Yeah. Volcanic bought it from somebody who bought it from somebody else. The design kept getting passed from one person to another because they kept having issues getting it to work successfully. And they did sell, each company did sell some guns, but each time it was just a, it was a marketing failure. And the, the next company would buy the patent and they would buy the old parts and then they would try something else and try something else. And it wasn't until New Haven Arms that they actually were successful with it where, where you would consider it a marketing success. Actually, the Volcanic sold very few of the lever action rifles. The company that should get credit for getting that thing together is Smith & Wesson. Smith & Wesson sold their design to Oliver Winchester. And Benjamin Tyler Henry was appointed, appointed with perfecting the design. And then a guy named, I think, uh, perfected it after that. So... And Winchester, all, by the way, is not a gun inventor at all. He's strictly a businessman. He's the guy with the money. And at the time, all of these guys knew each other. They all used to work together at different points in their career, either at Springfield Armory or for one company or one gunsmith or another. So all these people that were involved in the development of the lever action over several decades at one point or the other, knew each other, kind of like the whole six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing. <laughs> yeah, they're all kind of in the same uh, same gun family, if you will. Not, not that I know anything about lever <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, all right, so we go ahead, Tony. Yeah. Winchester bought the design from Smith & Wesson. They also pirated Tyler Henry from him, too, because he worked for them. Uh, he, they, he hired him, he hired him to run the factory and perfect the design. And then him and Henry had a bit of a pissing contest because, uh, he said, tell you what, I'll give you like a big signing bonus, but I get to keep the, the rights to whatever you design. And Henry was like, yeah, okay. And then later <laughs> when the gun started to sell, uh, and, and was doing really well, Henry goes, Hey, I want more money because of my design. And Winchester said, you see this piece of paper? And Henry was said, well, screw you. I'm out of here. And then he appointed another guy. I, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I thought it was King uh, to take over the factory. And he's the one who took it up to the next level to the 1866 model. So each person contributed something either to the cartridge or to the action of the rifle itself. Uh, several people over several decades, starting in the early 1800s actually so let's talk about buying one now guys let's get on to this topic if somebody wants one which way would you go let's just say that you've let's just say you got up to six seven hundred dollars you can spend on one would you guys just go get a would you go buy a new marlin 336 or a marlin series or would you go for a henry would you go for something a little bit older possibly what 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 kind of recommendation can we give to the viewers out there uh, I bought two Marlins in the past couple of years, man. I don't have a problem with them. And what are the calibers of those? I mean, I know, but I don't know if the if the viewers know what what do you what do you have in chambered in? One of them is forty four Magnum, and the other one's forty five seventy. Yeah. You know, the forty four Magnum option is great, especially if that's what you use for a revolver. I mean, you, you know, you can share the ammo between the two. You've got the reloading possibilities. Uh, you know, really, is from a budget standpoint, not a bad idea either. So, Tony, how have they been for you? I mean, fit and finish from the factory, are they just awesome looking? Were they great? Do they need any kind of tweaking at all to run better? Have you had the, to do anything to them at all? The fit and finish on the 44 Magnum was really good. Uh, the action was extremely rough feeling for a while, but it's breaking in just fine. Okay. 4570, 
I wasn't quite as pleased with the bit finish, but that gun comes out of the custom shop. You know, because what I got is the 26 inch barrel cowboy version with the octagon barrel. And I, the, I, I really liked his 4570, just FYI, because I shot it in Tulsa. That thing's awesome. What was the lag nice record? Did it, did it buck pretty good? Did it kick pretty good or what? It, it, I would say it kicked about the same as like a 12 gauge, hmm. but it was fun to shoot. I wish I had. Yeah. I, I had had a bit more chance to uh, shoot it a bit more than I did. But, again, we were firing all types of guns in, at, at the range day in Tulsa. So, okay. you know. I had light loads out there. I didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, I got a feeling you could probably make some pretty stout uh, rounds to push through that thing. Drop some buffalo or something, you know. God. I've, I've had the gun about putting me on my ass. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So the forty five seventy. So tell me, what what's a box of ammo cost for that? Just just if you're gonna buy an off, do you have any idea? I know that you do a lot of your own reloading and stuff, but uh, or are we looking at a buck around, buck fifty around? What's what's the price? To be honest with you, I mm -hmm. couldn't tell you. Okay. I, I bought one box of ammo for it, and that was. Yeah, you guys in the chat, you might want to do some research on the on the ammo cost. I mean, you can spend whatever you want on ammo anymore. Well, what I like about the thirty thirty is I can get a box of core locked at Walmart for seventeen bucks. Sometimes it's on fifty. I think it was thirteen fifty a box last spring, so I bought a bunch of boxes of it uh, to start stocking up on it. The only bad thing about thirty thirty, in my opinion, it'll probably be the same situation with forty five seventy. You know, if you wanted to buy remanufactured ammunition, there really is not there isn't much out there to be had. Uh, brass should be less of an issue, but uh, yeah, you know, the, the thirty thirty is going to be is going to be a solid round for you. But nothing wrong with forty five seventy either. All right. So, uh, Squib, what are your experiences with the uh, lever action? What do you got? What do you got in your collection, or what do you recommend? What do you think? Well, I've only got the one. I intend to get to get more, but uh, I'm a Henry guy. I mean, one rifle is enough to hook me. I'm I'm a Henry guy through and through. Uh, now, the the company that Henry Repeating Arms today is not New Haven firearms from the past they they got the rights to the name but they are not at all affiliated with oliver winchester benjamin tyler henry or, or new haven arms at all Hell, however they're not associated with henry arms of uh, like 1990 henry never owned well i shouldn't say he never owned a gun company he was oh wait wait no nah, the they uh henry repeating arms started in 1997 Right, but there was one little outlot right before that that put out the shittiest freaking rim fires ever. Oh, okay. That were under the name of Henry, and they put out those Golden Boys. Are you sure it's not Henry Repeating Arms? Because they started off with, uh, well, no, they started theirs was the traditional. Then they went to the Golden Boy. I heard that they had um, early quality issues with the guns, but they got that cleared up. And that these days. Well the, yeah, these days they're they're known for a uh, reputation of, of uh, quality firearm. I mean, they're not cheap. I mean, you can get an entry level uh, 22 long rifle Henry for around 400 bucks. Uh, but uh, as far as their customer service, I've I've dealt with them, and they're really good people. They're coming out with new stuff all the time. I mean, there are some things I'd like to see them make, and they do have a, a suggestion box. Uh, I just haven't put any any ideas in there yet, but uh, I mean, they've even got a lever action shotgun. So I mean, there's there's lots of different options. What I'd really like to get is the reproduction of the 1860 Henry rifle, and it's about as close as you're going to get to the original as possible because the 44 Henry rimfire round doesn't exist anymore, but. Uh, later on, they uh, took some of those rifles in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, and converted them to fire uh, 4440 Winchester centerfire. So if you got uh, a reproduction 1860 Henry in 4440, it, you could say that you would be shooting something like somebody in the, uh, say, 1880s could have been carrying on their farm or ranch out west. As um, I understand it, they went back to forging that barrel and magazine out of one piece of steel like the original, too. Yeah, they use that. Um, it's brass, but it's not brass. It's it's some sort of alloy or something, and, and it gives it a, a, they got a name for it. It's like gun 
gunmetal or something like that. I can't remember. It's I haven't had enough coffee, guys. <laughs> so, quick question for there was a question from the chat, Henry, you, you Henry guys. Um, they're not they're not side loading their their front tube loading magazine, right? Yeah, All yeah, and I are. don't I don't understand. Yeah, they they are. Um, you 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 load it from the tube underneath the barrel. Uh, you just you pull out the the follower, and there's a little cutout, and you just drop them in. I don't understand um, why that's a deal breaker for some people. But I mean, to each their own. We all like what we like, so uh, maybe it's just speed right? of reloading. Possibly is that is that the one thing? Maybe if people in like a some sort of a self defense situation, if you'd have to reload, I don't know. I don't understand. I mean, fear of losing the tube. You know, uh, if you're around uh -huh. people who use tubular magazines. Everybody's heard of somebody who's lost their freaking tube, although I've never seen it. I've never seen that. Angry, uh, Hmm. I got a gun where I've lost the bolt out of it, but I still have the tube in it. Well, I'll tell you this. If you lose your tube out of your Henry, if you contact their customer service and you give them your information, they'll send you a new tube. So if, you, if you're if you talking about the follower, I mean, the, the tube doesn't fall off. It's bolted to the barrel. But if you're talking about the, the follower that you, uh, you close up the, the tube with after you put the rounds in, if you happen to lose it, or break it, Henry will send you a new one. Now, I'm just curious because I can see breaking it, but losing it? I mean, I grew up shooting 22s that were tubular magazines, you know, pump action 22s. Same same basic type of, of magazine, though. And I never lost that tube. I mean, I'd go out and, you know, hunt rabbits, squirrels in the trees. And uh, I never I never lost the thing when I was a kid. And I wasn't the most responsible kid. So I'm just I, curious. I mean, what do you, are you riding a horse and shooting buffalo with the thing and you lose it? or? I have no idea. I've never lost one either. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean it's, it, it just seems like now breaking it, you know, if you, if you put it in your back pocket, which is what I always did. I just stuffed it down in my back pocket and loaded my rifle and then grabbed it out of my pocket, you know. Um, I could see breaking the thing I or dropping it in the dirt, anything. you know, and something like that. But... I have lost a magazine out of a 22, but uh, never the freaking tube. I mean, that's why I don't get guns with magazines when I want to hunt with them. I use the tubular magazine Marlins, and plus they're more accurate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. I just, I think it's a, it's a personal preference thing, but I don't see an advantage of one over the other. <laughs> Let's uh, let's go back to that 410 shotgun. I want to do uh, guys. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. There's one advantage to the side gate, and that's you can load it without taking it off your shoulder. Right. Here's that oh, okay. uh, that lever right. action 410, guys. This is again, it's going to be the the front loading tube magazine and a tubular magazine. So this is the the lever action shotgun that Henry makes, uh, 24 inch or 20 inch uh, barrel. What do you guys think about that? Would you ever consider picking one of these up, or would you just stick with a conventional pump action shotgun? Or what's what are your thoughts this, on this? This this is on the list. <laughs> I'd have to plug it to only hold three rounds, so there's not much point. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. So the 2017 is when these came out. I'm looking. It's based on the for the the frame of the 4570. I'd have so to I've come got... up with the justification for a 410 because I've I've never. <laughs> In my mind, you know, in my house, I've I've never found justification, found reason to have a four ten. Uh, you even, know what? Even a judge, I have no desire. The, well, if if yeah. the missus doesn't like the recoil of a twelve gauge, yeah. there you go. Then I'll the get only, her a twenty. <laughs> the only problem with the four ten is they get heavy because you got thicker barrels. They tend to weigh more, if not the same. And so you know, if it's some, if it comes in terms of being able to handle the firearm itself. Uh, you know, when you're running a, a 410, they aren't necessarily lighter, you know. Back in the day, the gun writers in magazines, and I'm not going to name magazines because I can tell you which one it was, said that the 410 is not a kid's gun. It's for people who know how to shoot a shotgun. Yeah. yeah that's what I would agree spread, with that. You know, yeah. Tra Travis, you can agree with me on this one, I think. But oh, what's if, that? If I was going to get a lever action shotgun, uh -huh. I would probably get an a Winchester 1887 because you know that's the one that was in Terminator 2. Oh, yeah, there you, you have go. that kind of cash. Absolutely. Yeah. I know where there is one, it just doesn't well, fire. No. 
I do I do know a couple companies that do make reproductions. No, I was curious about that. All that right. was not an 1887. I don't know why IMDb <laughs> and all of these sites say it's an 18, It's a 1901. It's because the 1887 they're... can't shoot smokeless powder without blowing up the gun. It's because they're not gun people that put this stuff up on there. That's the reason why. Because they don't. They think they know. They see something that looks they... like a gun and. They, they redid that lever action shotgun in 1901 in 12 gauge only, I believe. And that one can take the pressure of smokeless powder. But the 1887 model available in 10 or 12 gauge was black powder only. So you're going to tell me that when he was in that gun store, uh, or uh, I mean, uh, when he was uh, in, at that bar, the guy had not only the shotgun, but he had black powder uh, yeah, rounds for it, and there w there wasn't that much smoke that come out of that shotgun. Hey, uh, so Scoop, I want to give you a little bit of praise here. I want to show something here real quick. This is <laughs> uh, okay. So even the International Movie Firearm Database calls it a Winchester 1887. Wikipedia the 1887, <laughs> and you'll see that they had a 1901 model. Yeah, this uh, this is so, why you don't want to believe what you read on the internet. Okay, dang. Here's a couple. They have shown a couple of ones that were actually used in the movie. Apparently, uh, one of the props and one of the actual functional I mean, firearms. Yeah, there, yeah, there were there were blank. It, it, so it, 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 while you're technically correct, the, the Wikipedia page says Winchester model 1887/1901. Yeah, I trust. I trust what Squibb's going to say over anything else. <laughs> there are two separate models. There are yeah. two well, separate models. Different they're two separate groups. models, but the Wikipedia page says, for, for all intents and purposes, they're the same model. If the well, Terminator they are was because an actual logical machine, he'd have chose a fucking pump shot. Yeah, not that lucky. Oh, they did the <laughs> lever so he could ride a motorcycle and shoot. If he was being logical, he would have got a semi. <laughs> we lost everybody. <laughs> That's great. What? <laughs> what Hopefully, I, I don't know. I hope I get a, I get a copyright strike for showing every, off. Every everybody, everybody lost mobile. I guess. <laughs> Man. Okay. Uh, now that we're, now that we're back, um, if, no. if the Terminator was being logical, yeah, he would have. But the Terminator was being opportunistic. It was the only shotgun yeah. on the porch of that bar, so that's what he took. But uh, but Good yeah, point. now. Now, it, it can say 1887 or 1901, but the fact is that was a movie prop that, yeah, it fired blanks. So, <laughs> And most of the time, I bet it was a rubber gun. Yeah. Are, are we trying to say that the stuff that we see in Hollywood movies might not actually be real? No, oh, David. No, that's so. crazy talk. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid that, so. No. You know, the, the thing about Hollywood is it's good entertainment. But the bad, the, and that's a good thing. That's what we go for. That's what we spend money on movie tickets and buy all the memorabilia and all that garbage. The bad thing is your average moron sees this stuff and goes, it's real. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they no. treat it like it's game. That's true. And that's then true. they get elected to Congress and they take away our rights because it's yeah, real. That's the same reason we have this, the bans that we have right now because people believe that suppressors make a gun completely silent or, you know, and more ARs deadly. Can, and, and and that an AR can blow up an elephant, or that or that you could take this <laughs> this this uh, lever action shotgun and shoot somebody and knock them through two walls. Now, when without started, knocking yourself through those two walls, well, if there's because small nobody enough, understands, I mean, if nobody understands enough, Newton's laws. If it's like a Smurf or something, I sure would probably work. But you know, now every action started, has an equal and opposite reaction. What? When I started on this show, I was watching the original Terminator movie. And I absolutely just forgot where I was going with that. Oh, he, he used a pump action. He used a pump. They both were using cop shotguns. Were they? No, 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 no. That shotgun or was auto. fancy. It could go pump or auto. No, oh, this basketball. No, no, no. I'm talking about in the first chase scene when they were, uh, the Terminator stole the cop car and oh. they were in the chase scene and they were shooting at each other with pump action shotguns. Yes. <laughs> Terminator bit was when he shoots the first Sarah Connor, he's in there with a the long slide 45. That's not as loud as my fucking CO2 BB gun. But no silence on it. I mean, this is just a gun by itself. I'm like, obviously, none of these people involved in this have never been around a real gun going on. Oh, no, no. Yeah, you'd be deaf after the first no, shot. No, obviously not. 
<laughs> well, you got to remember, Tony, in the 80s, people weren't really known for bringing in experts uh, to deal with the guns on a movie. They just kind of did whatever was good good TV or good filmmaking. It wasn't until lately, you know, the last 15, 20 years, that people have actually brought in experts to train these actors. Kevin Costner had about the best statement on that on his movie, Open Range. He said, I wanted to make gunshots exceptionally loud in the film because they are in real life. He yeah. Said, if you're standing in a room with a gun, it'll deafen you. Did Costner direct that one too? No. Okay. Reynolds directed it. Costner okay. co wrote it. Okay. I know. I, don't, I, I just thought he did a pretty good job with some of the stuff that he has directed. Dances with Wolves was really good. I'm not saying that uh, we should all shy away from entertainment. I'm just saying, use some common sense, people. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Here, here. Moving right along, though. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, would you would you would you recommend people buy a Marlin these days? I mean, do you think that that they've got their game together? That uh, you're you're going to be okay buying one, or should you still go for the the, the pre Freedom Group vintage style ones? I mean, obviously, if you want certain models, you're going to have to buy a new one. But what, what's your take on Marlin today? What do you guys I think? I can tell you specifically about their barrels are really good today. Now, okay. Yes. Uh, like I said, I have a little bit of a bitch with the fit finish of this 1895, but they might have been trying to antique the thing, too. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Uh, and it's not enough that it bothers me any. But look at them. I mean, whatever you buy, look at it. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Try to work the action. Take a look, make sure the fit and finish is where you want it. Uh, one thing I have heard about, and I have not had a chance to try this. You know, they got the they call it micro groove rifling, the micro groove barrel. So this is what I've got in the three thirty six CS. Um, I've always wanted to try the uh, the Hornady uh, Lev Revolution ammo, and I have not because I've heard that that rifling for whatever reason does not work well with that round. That round was developed for the Winchester when they made that ammunition for the uh, for the 3030 rifle. And so I haven't had a chance to try that ammunition yet. I'd like to because it's got the SST tip on it and it's a pointed tip, but it's safe to load in the tube magazine, not to worry about it going off. Now they're not using that exclusively anymore because both of my guns don't have it. Okay. Uh, well, this is an older, I've got an older barrel and some of the, the feedback I've read from people is it doesn't, there's no noticeable improvement. I mean, you might have better takedown power if you can actually hit your target. But in terms of accuracy and function, it's not it's not what you would expect from a, a higher grade ammunition, I guess I would say. The uh, 44 I have is 1894, and it has Valor rifling in it, which is basically polygonal. Okay. Uh, and then the other one just has deep cut rifling, 4570. Okay. That may be a feature to the fact that it's a 4572. You know, generally yeah. those are considered soft lead rounds, so they would need a deeper rifling to make the gun work. Probably. Yeah. Now let's let's look at something a little more higher end. Now Sandhills and I have some firsthand experience with these guys, uh, Bighorn Armory. We got the chance to meet the guys sure. over in uh, Tulsa, and they're they're known for little gems like the uh, 500 Automax AR pattern rifle and the 500 uh, Smith and Wesson 18 inch carbine Model 89. Here's what I really want for Christmas: the Model 89 Trapper 16 inch barrel 500 Smith. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that yeah. just be fun? Did you look at their prices? Did Let's you look at I their have, prices? I yeah, we have, have to take out a home mortgage to buy one, but uh, yeah. yeah, they're. I think they. What do they start at twenty five hundred dollars and go up from there? I, dude, yeah, the, ba the so, base is okay. twenty five or three grand, and then all the yeah. options. So, yeah. The the gun that I, that I was gonna spec out or it, yeah. with the uh, the gray laminate stock, and, and it was mm -hmm. gonna be in five hundred. Um, Ghost ring sights, all that. I, I had that sucker up to about seventy five hundred bucks. Yeah, you option it out the like options. a Porsche, like a Porsche, man. I mean, you option. You but, can start the base model, and then every you can tack on all these additional stainless, you know, case hardening patina finish, and this and that. Yeah, that's what it was. It was it was yeah, the case, case hardening hardened. finish. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I was gonna get. Yep. If you that's look it. at if you look at these these shotgun or I mean the shotgun these lever action rifles, if you look at the way they're set up, you look at all the different options you can get on them. You look at how they're already they're, they're I mean they've they've taken all the you know uh, accessorizing out of it. You can just go I mean more or less off the shelf. This thing is it, they they've thought about they've thought ahead. I mean I really like that. But the I think the reason their price is so high is because they're running that out of a dang shed. Get a factory. 
Yeah, they're they're just not mass producing them. That's a lot of it. Yeah, they're a one off. If they mass produce or... these things, this is another one of those guns where it's like if you just mass produce it, you could bring the price down so low that everybody could have one and you'd make more money in the end, but they're not doing that. You but know, it could that... be a could be a capital issue too. They might not have enough money to build a, a factory. Or maybe they don't want to get that big. Maybe they like the fact because the way I understand it, they they build a rifle from start to finish, and then they build another one. I don't think they're even they're even doing lots of barrels or lots of yeah. receivers at a time. I think they're doing one rifle at a time still. I yeah. don't think that you're going to lose quality when you go into mass production unless you let things get away from you. You can have the same quality as these as these hand as these hand built with mass production if you do it right. I just it, maybe it isn't their business model. Maybe they don't want to branch out. Maybe they but they if they keep doing this, you know, uh, only only a few people are going to have these things. That's the sad thing. I, it looks like a good quality firearm, but I am not going to pay that sort of money. And yet there are people that do. I mean, they said that they export to Australia. They've got, you know, the full manufacturer's license, so they can send it to whoever, you know, to countries where people might not be able to have certain firearms. They can have one of these. And so that's if, another one of their customer bases, too. If I had that kind of money, I would spend it on one of those rifles. If, if nothing else, because the, you know, the 15 minutes that Travis and I spent with those guys, they didn't know who we were at all. But they were so nice, even before they found out that we were going to be putting them up on on uh, YouTube, YouTube. Yeah. and yeah. those guys are just really cool. The if you watch the YouTube videos from them, uh, Sam Koontz is the guy that uh, is usually in all the videos, and he was the guy that we were talking to, and that's who Travis interviewed. And uh, he's just a super super nice guy. And if I had the money to support their company, I would do it just to support their company. But unfortunately, they they've priced themselves out of my league. Yeah, I mean, I look at him. It's one of those one of those bucket list retirement guns, you know. It's maybe someday, maybe someday, but uh, they are. I, also, I, mean, I was just impressed with them, though, too. Yeah, I also thought I was never going to get a uh, a Browning rifle, and and my wife surprised me with that. So maybe next year on the anniversary, I'll get a I'll get a Bighorn Armory. Who knows? I'll I'll make a few calls at Tulsa, and I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> that would be great, and we'll see if Santa can't put that five hundred Smith underneath the Christmas tree. <laughs> it's it's going to be harder because uh, if if we make it this next year, she's going to be with me. So yeah, there you go, there you go, man. Hi. Hey, you know you might be one vehicle short, but it'll be under the Christmas tree. <laughs> That's all right. I'll, yeah. I'll walk around with it. <laughs> AWAG, AWAG is with us. Uh, I know you've been here for a little while. I've been doing screen share stuff, so I'm not paying attention to the chat, unfortunately. No, nah, I just hopped in like a minute ago. Uh, okay, so AWAG, what's your take on lever guns? Because, you know, you're all about the cutting edge of precision, and, you know, you've got the you've got this little this little niche area that you're really good with. What are your thoughts on the uh, archaic lever action rifle? What do you think about it, man? Um, to tell you the truth, I shot one lever action, and I enjoyed it a little bit. Okay. Uh, it's just not my thing. Okay. Um, but if I were to Pass have, for me. if I were to have one lever, action, he's young. He doesn't know how to appreciate fine arts and crafts. I do he's, like. He's I, know, I know he's which one Awag would want. I know which one he, he would know, want. He probably does. It's uh, Winchester 1895, chambered in 762 by 54 R. Oh. Awag, how can you not want to just yeah. take this home? Come on, yeah. man, look at this. Look at this. Don't you want one of these? Wouldn't that be fun? Come on, man! You're the little brother. I never thought I'd have a cowboy gun in my life either. And he's uh, so sweet. You know? Hey, Wag, you can you can still take well, I mean, gear get, with that uh, with that Russian side. contract rifle. So you're give fine. it to the lever side, brother. Just don't just don't <laughs> put some stupid scope on it and ruin the no, the no, no, value. No. Okay, I'm not that <laughs> dumb. The rifle is good. Hey, by the way, look at my look at my antique rifle. I just drilled and tapped it. Isn't it great? For the record, okay. Let me. Here's my stipulation: is if I buy it from somebody and it has Picatinny rail segments on it, it gets a scope. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Well, mine has the machining a side mount for it, Awag. Oh, there you go. The 45 degree Magpul Emba sights on it. <laughs> I don't. I don't do backup iron sights uh, on any of my optic guns. I. I, I don't see a use for them. You could just That's wrap right. it in blue tape. Hey, there we the go. Scope on with blue tape. There you go. That's it, man. That's all you got to do. The the, the white trashicle uh, setup on it. Well, if you saw that the Bighorn Armory, they offer one with the Trigicon, uh, what RMR on the back of it or whatever. 
Mm-hmm. So that hey, there you go, man. You're set to go. Of course, that's from the factory. It's yeah, it, like I said, if it comes with Picatinny rail segments, it gets mm-hmm. a scope. Mm-hmm. But so, um, kind of jumping into yeah, uh, yeah, the reason yeah. why I kind of jumped in here yeah. is because I was hearing everybody talk about like if they were to mass produce them, that it would bring the price down. With some of these situations, it's um, it's it's kind of like those niche markets. There's no real demand for 500 Smith and Wesson uh, lever actions. Now I know that everybody here probably wants one. Yeah, sure. There's there's that small demand, but the majority of people in the firearms community, there's no real demand for it. When people want to you see know, maybe a these... bunch of kids who just want the guns in the video games, but the rest of us do. So <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt about the Bushmaster ACR, and then. I thought it was really cool, and now I regret it. All Bighorn it. has to do is put it in the next whatever at Fortnite, oh. and oh, then God. everybody will want one. Um, you know what? They've That's got true. a lever action gun in PUBG. If you guys play PUBG, um, they've got one in there in the PC version. I don't know if it's the, in the Winchester Xbox. 94. Yeah. Is that what they call it? I have no I think, idea. I think it. that's yeah. what it's called. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as usefulness goes, it would be more useful in 460 than 500. I would agree. That's the one I would get, actually. But um, most of the time with these small companies, and I say that in reference to this company, is much smaller than, say, uh, Remington or Smith & Wesson or uh, even Winchester today. Um, they're, they're not in the mass production of firearms is, yeah, you, you crank out a few thousand uh, rifles. Um, I don't know what, uh, what their actual numbers are, but they crank out thousands of rifles in a year. Whereas this this company probably only puts out a f- like maybe a few hundred a year, so there's there's a steep uh, like stark difference between the the mass producers and these smaller companies, and at the same time, you don't know what their building is like. Like machining takes time. They they did a video. They did a video. It's a tin shack. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even look at Keltac. Their their facility is massive, but they're still they're in that mid range zone. They're not a big company, but they're not a small company. It's still hard to get hold of their rifles. You know, it's still hard to find them. I I've looked at a few Keltec models, and and they're just not in stock, man. I mean, it, or if you find one, and then the price, and you would think for the prices they charge for some of their guns, that there would be more of them out there. Not their handguns, but their rifles are really expensive. Their carbines are really pricey. Mm-hmm. I want to talk I, about. I wanna get- I want to get an RFB, but I've heard yeah. people have so many issues with the RFBs that it just put me off from buying one. Yeah. Now that the Tavor 7 came out, I already freaking pre-ordered one of those. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I'm, I'm stoked for that. But I, uh, I just want to comment on Squibb's comment about uh, Bighorn being in a tin shed. It's Cody, Wyoming. Everybody is in a tin shed in Cody, Wyoming. Yeah, this is another well, extension of Western you know, Nebraska. And- that's probably more of their it's probably more their business model. We're from here, we want to stay here. Maybe that, they that can't get they... a building, maybe they can't get a building built out there or maybe no bank will give them any, a loan out there. But if they move to a more industrial area where everybody's got a factory, Ooh. it'd be so easy. Hey, hey, Wyoming is an industrial area. Wyoming is one of the big hotspots for factories because they have low property taxes, they have huge bonuses for the companies to go there. Mackles up there. I mean, they got out of Colorado and went to Wyoming and Texas. So, they, I mean, you know, yeah, they, they to Texas. So, I mean, they're, they Wyoming, Wyoming is too. huge for manufacturing because they've got the land and they want the business out there. So, they give the benefit, you know. So, I mean, I, I like the fact that they're keeping it small, that they're focusing on the craftsmanship, that they're, and maybe that's how they justify the price too, is they're, they're you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very limited production, you know, very much hand manufactured firearm that they can use in their opinion to justify the price. You well, know, and the other, I'm the other thing saying, is too. I'm not saying they're okay. They're making it by hand. They're making it in Cody. They're doing it their way. They're doing. I'm not saying they don't make a quality item, and I'm not saying that you don't have the craftsmanship there. I'm also not saying that it, it's it's uh, uh, and that business model doesn't work. For some people, it works. They may purposely want to keep it this way because they just can't handle getting big or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But if you want everybody to have one of these in their gun safe. You mass produce and you make it the but average man's price, and and you can yeah. mass produce and still make a quality item. So if, if the reason the guns cost this much, you could say, oh, it's because all the man hours of labor and blah. No, they're purposely keeping them this way by building them this way. 
It's well, not that hard to get to get financing and, and get yeah. a factory. It and isn't. maybe that's what they want. Maybe that's the model. Maybe that's what they're happy with. And that's just how that they know that they don't have it's, a huge customer base. A, you know, it's a free country and it's a capitalist society. If that's the way they want to do it, that's yeah. who want to do it. But it's going to keep me from buying one. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, well, a lot of people. And, and here's the thing, though. Even if you mass produce, yeah, you can keep quality up there, but that keeps the cost up there too. Because if you look at all of the factories that, you know, the, they're putting out a product that is relatively inexpensive, typically, you know, their, their tolerances for QC are a little bit lower. And, you know, if, if you're going to have, like, right now they're building something where, you know, it, it's, it's hand fit and you know that everyone that comes out of there is going to work right because they've tested it extensively. You know, they, they don't test one out of every hundred. They test one out of every one. And so when you mass produce, that comes, you know, that can get a little bit lax. Now, if it's not, then you have to pay somebody to check every one of them. And that keeps the cost up there, too. Yeah. It's still not, just, it's not the same thing as this. We're running it out of a tin shack in the middle of nowhere making I agree. every piece by hand cost. I agree. So You're right. I'm I not can tell you, you. In, in manufacturing where I'm at, they're sticklers for quality. And that's one of their things that... Uh, gets them the contracts. Everybody wants to buy plastics from, from my plant because we make some of the most difficult parts as far as the shape, even though I still don't get that. But, but these guys, they put quality over everything else. And I'm not saying they don't find ways to cut costs or save money or, you know, uh, uh, somebody, somebody quit, so we're not going to worry about hiring a new person right away. We'll just work the crap out of that guy over there and save a little bit of money until we hire. So I'm not saying all factories do, all companies do stuff like that. To, but but um, they, they are sticklers on their, their quality, and that's how you stay in the game. So if you get a reputation for making crap guns, yeah, you might, you might uh, drive yourself out of business. We've seen that before, too. I'm just saying that mass producing is not this – this, if, if you do it right, you can do it one of two ways. You can either let it get to your head and start making crap and run yourself out of business, or you can do it the right way, and now everybody can have one of these things, and they're just as good as the hand-fitted ones. Yeah. Now, there's something that we have not had a chance to discuss yet, and I want to just kind of uh, just, just test the waters on this one. What's your opinion on the mayor's leg? Is that the perfect truck gun? I don't want one. What do you guys think about that? Because I mean, in, in a way, you know, it's what's considered a pistol, right? If I'm, well, not if I'm ever a, or something, yeah. If I'm ever a brown killer, I'll probably carry one. Would you guys ever consider buying one at all, or not? I would not. I have. No. You guys ever fired one before? Has anybody ever had a chance to shoot one? No, because I think uh, G Webs has one or had one. Didn't you? I've seen. I think he's featured it in videos before in the past. I was just kind of curious. All right. So anyway, just something been. I wanted to put out there, just kind of test the waters, what you guys think about those, but I don't know. If I've always been curious about them too. I've never, yeah. never yeah. even handled one. Yeah. They're a little bit pricey when you look around there. They're definitely up there in price. I mean, I don't know if I've seen one below $500 to be honest with you, but uh, kind of a limited production thing. I don't think you see a ton of them out there. The only ones you're going to find for under $500 are the 22s. Mm -hmm. Because they do come in 22 as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of checking to see what you guys think about that. So, um, Any other thoughts on lever guns, guys? Would you recommend people pick one up or would something to stay away I, from? What do you guys think? I have a question. Yeah. And, and I'm not being goofy this time. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm at a gun show or you know a pawn shop or whatever looking at used lever guns, what do I look for? Because, like, you know, if a revolver, you're looking for flame cut under the top strap, things like that. Yeah. Um, but with with a lever gun, what do you look for as far as knowing if it's going to be, you know, reliable or, or not? Tony, you want to chime in on this, or anybody want to help us out on this one? Because this one that I bought was more or less an impulse purchase. The the lever was smooth, the action felt solid. Um, you know, it was it had, was not it wasn't rusted out. I checked the barrel. The, the the rifling was was great. Anybody want to chime in on what to look for if you buy a used lever gun? Rifling condition is probably one of the key things it's going to tell how much it's been used yeah uh, other than that the feel of the action okay there's, yeah. that's another question how how easy is it to check that out without a without some sort of a of a camera i mean you can't really get light down in the 
in the barrel very well, can you? Yeah, this is, we are unloaded, guys. I cleared it before the video. Just, you know, smooth. Just, you know, not not a lot of, just, I don't know, it's hard to see it. Just It should just be a smooth action. You should just be able to move it with, you know, nothing you're not going to jangling or making a bunch of noise and stuff. I mean, yeah, that's a nice lockup. And obviously, you know, dry fire it. Um, that's a good question. I mean, the parts it's easy to find parts for them. I mean, that's one good thing about it. in case you need to swap something out or get yourself a new piece or part, there's parts readily available for it. Um, you know, I mean, suppose the lever could take a lot of beat on it. If you take the, you could unscrew and take the lever out itself and look at it uh, and, and see if it's all worn down and beat up or chewed up or, or not. But um, you know, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Anytime you, you buy used guns, I would say look for rust on the gun, look for any kind of corrosion inside the receiver, any pitting, look inside the barrel. Like Tony said, those would be the main things. Uh, the stocks can be replaced. Stocks are not an issue. Finished guns can always be refinished, you know. I uh, have never seen a lever gun that wouldn't shoot. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's another part of it is they're so mechanical. It's not like you're relying on any kind of a gas system or any kind of a semi-automatic uh, action in order to function. Uh, I would, I would honestly, I would say that the, the, the barrel condition, the rifling, if you've got nice strong grooves in there, I think that you'd be making a solid purchase. Because that's going to indicate just how much the thing has been fired, how much wear and tear it's actually taken. When I looked down this one and saw the nice rifling, nice solid rifling down the barrel, it wasn't all worn out, it wasn't pitted, nice shiny bore. I mean, I, I knew it's, it was a gun that I was going to take home with me. So for me, that would that would be definitely the thing to look for. Any other comments on that, guys? Buying used? I mean, and the thing is... Here's the thing, though, you know, you can get a new one. I've seen them, you know, obviously I want you to shop locally, but I've seen them at Walmart for 336s for, I want to say, under $400 in Nebraska. I mean, you you can get a new one. I'm sure there's going to be guys that, if, especially if they have a used one that's a vintage model, like a pre-freedom group model, they're going to want a premium for it. If you look online and check the prices, you're going to pay a bit more for that because they know they've got a model that people want because they want that traditional Marlin craftsmanship uh, that came with it before the acquisition by Freedom Group. So, God, price-wise, unless it's got the features that you really want, you know, I, I would almost consider just say go go buy new, in my opinion. I don't know. Would you guys pick up a, a good used lever gun, or would you would you just prefer to go new if you're going to buy one? Say it's in the caliber you want. Would you buy used? God, I wish to Christ I could have found used ones when I was buying. I would have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I suppose, exactly. I suppose it depends on if it's an antique, you know, Winchester yeah. 73 or... Yeah. <laughs> Something yeah, that's going to be another part of it, too, so, yeah. Something about lever guns that rarely gets touched on by anybody is the fact that they are natural pointers. Yeah. You throw a lever gun to your shoulder, the sights are where they're supposed to be. It's strange, but it's better yeah. than any other gun I've ever handled. Yeah, we're yeah I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, Rob D. saying, good morning. I checked for wiggling and strong lockup. Uh, Midnight Rangers give some tips on how to check the how to how to light your bore without using a flashlight, using your thumbnail to reflect light down the bore. Uh, Actually, me and Sean were uh, were wondering this because we were at the gun show in Tulsa, and uh, the easiest way to, to uh, inspect a bore is to put a piece of paper in the chamber, a white piece of paper in the chamber, flash a light on it, and you can see right down the barrel. Ah, yeah, good point. Tacos and French fries is making a request from the chat that I get the Ruger Ranch out of the camera because every time he sees it, he wants to go buy one. Buy one. Go get one. Buy a Howl Mini Action instead. Buy, it's better. Buy, buy both. Don't listen to the hipster kid. Buy both. I've got, got, got an AK, and that's Sorry. the only gun don't, I want. Don't listen to the guy that shoots precision rifles and builds guns for fun, okay? Just go buy the Ruger. Buy them both. <laughs> Um, I just want to say right now, I mean, this is not lever gun related, but this, they're a little pricey, you know, you're, you're looking in the $400 range, but I mean, the fact that you can shoot this thing all day for, for nothing, I mean, 40 rounds for 10 bucks, if you want to go steel case, it was designed to fire steel case ammo. I, I love, and the only problem with this thing is that I, I shoot it, you know, 100, 150 rounds at a time. I'm not worried about wearing out the barrel. It's got a cold hammer forged barrel, but the value on this thing, especially if you're looking at taking game under 300 yards. Man, and I've got some you can't see over here. There's a box of uh, SST ammo that I'm going to take out for because you can get steel case SST rounds, which is just like the Hornady Black ammo for thirty dollars, twenty seven dollars for fifty rounds. And so that's going to probably be the deer round that I'm going to run through this because I've I've just I've read enough about the 
the ammo and reviews and tests and seeing their yeah, videos on it. It's it's a potent round for up to 200 uh, yards. What's up? Your scope is on the Ruger. What's that? What is that on the Ruger? Yes. That is actually that is a. Uh, it's not a Sonic King. I think it's the Pinty HK. It's like a four to twenty four by fifty, or six to twenty four by fifty. Um, I ran a hundred rounds through it and it kept zero. I really am going to just invest in some higher end glass at some point, but I've just been range testing these little forty to hundred dollar scopes, and uh, you know, seeing if they'll keep zero and see if they actually work, and they work fine. I love the magnification on that one. In fact, that's I got some lower rings for it, which is why I need to take it back out now because it came with these high mount rings, which really kept you up high on the stock. This will give you a better cheek weld. Um, now I think it's Pinty brand on Amazon. They sent it for me to test, and I'm going to be testing it with my deer rifle ammo. If I have any problems with that thing, I'm just going to break down and buy maybe an entry level uh, uh, low pull, low pulled, or maybe go with a nice Nikon or Vortex. I will put an I will put nicer glass on it, but. Funny thing is, for like for years, my little go-to scope has just been a hundred dollar, hundred twenty-five dollar center point that a buddy gave me that he bought at Walmart. We've run that thing on thirty out sixes. We've run it on five five six. We've run it on the Ruger Ranch. So you know, you just get whatever glass is going to work for you. So not to draw out the question, but that's yeah. Now that's what I'm running on it right now. This is the the Christensen Arms over here has the V three XI on the top or V three IX from uh, Leopold Leopold. I always mispronounce it. Hornady, Hornaday, it's a problem I have. So, um, you know, when, yeah. When you test those cheap scopes, do you ever shoot around the square with them? What do you mean? You you get it zeroed, you know, to where it's hitting to, to point of aim. And then um, take it like an inch to the left or two inches or whatever. You just, just click your reticle. Um, you know, like just shoot a two-inch square. Click it two, two inches to the left, two inches down. Two inches right, two inches up. It should hit the same hole that you first started with, or you know. Well, at 100 yards, though, you're going to be that. looking at you're going to be looking at an eighth of an inch. This this one, I believe, is one eighth inch MOA uh, for every click at 100 yards. One eighth okay. or one quarter. I think it's one. Well, but I mean, but yeah. I mean, that's kind of the the if it's repeatable, you know, if if you uh, if it goes back to the same place every time, you know what I mean. So if you if you move it an inch yeah. at a time. So click it eight times to the left and then go down eight well, times and then go right eight times and come back up eight times. You should be back to where you started. I am going to start doing the two shot zero, but it'll take me nine to 12 rounds at the most to get these guns sighted in. Cause I shoot these huge paper targets so I can see where the bullets are landing. And then I will make the click adjustments to adjust it where it needs to be. But I see what you're saying. Is it precise enough on the internals to go back to where it needs to be? If you move it a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember who it was. It was somebody used to be in like guns and ammo or something would would review optics, and he'd always shoot around the square, and uh -huh. you know okay. that was kind of how he would tell you if it was a, a good solid okay. scope or not. And, and the the cheap ones, you know, you might be off by a quarter inch, but the yeah. the higher end ones, you know, the the thousand dollar scopes, those would almost always put it through the same original hole. This one, uh, a couple times in the video, I smacked it, I think three times on the top and the side, and then did it again, so it had. Got hit with the. I used my muzzle brake from the AMD 63 because I watched the 22 Plinkster video where he did that with the Sonic King scope. He hit it with a hammer, a ball peen hammer, and it was moving. It was it lost at zero, and so that was that was the reason why he didn't recommend it. I mean, all I can tell you is I put 100 rounds through this thing in the range in one sitting, and it doesn't lose zero. I think it's going to be okay. I mean, a lot of scopes might lose zero if you drop them or have an impact on them, especially right where the turrets are. So yeah. I don't, I mean, you would say, well, a good scope isn't going to lose zero. I don't know. But I mean, if it's going to survive a hundred rounds, I would feel safe taking it for a shot on a deer. Um, but like I said, I'm going to be moving away from these. These are just for testing purposes. I mean, I'm not, I do want to buy some higher end glass and just invest some money in that because as I get older, I appreciate more clear glass and getting away from the budget red dots and the budget glass and getting into something a little bit nicer. Um, and, you know, uh, Leupold has scopes that start at 179 bucks. American made with a lifetime warranty. So, you know, not to make this into a rifle chat, but Hey, it is deer season, right? So, <laughs> so why not? But yeah, if, if people were asking in the chat about that, that thing's got um, four inches of eye relief and or three, three, three inches of eye relief, something like that. It's a really nice little scope for 40 bucks. So and I've actually got another one I'm going to be testing. I've got the Pinty Pro line that they sent me, which is a hundred dollar scope that uses crystal glass lenses and uh, that one's just a three to nine by 40. I'm going to put that on the AR and test it out too. So I love testing these cheap scopes because when I first got into shooting and deer hunting and so on, I was just using Bushnells. I was using Tascos and they would work just fine. So, uh, yeah, no, they're good. 
All right, let's move on to our next topic. Again, these are all of your suggested topics, except for lever guns. The lever gun topic came up last week when we were chatting. We said, let's do a lever gun chat. So uh, hopefully we've convinced you that it's time to go buy one if you don't have one. They are awesome. Yes, I did. Um, what's that, Tony? I said, yes, I did. Say, let's go have a lever gun chat. Yeah, there we all go. The there we go. Um, you know, the thing is, I bought that to make it my truck gun. Now it's like, man, they're, they're going up in value. I don't want to leave it in my vehicle. I'd rather lose a $325 AR and not a four five hundred dollar lever action you know so it doesn't really travel with me as much as i thought it was going to um so the next topic that we have here is when you guys look at buying a handgun let's say you're you're in the market for you, you want to customize a gun would you guys rather buy the gun stock and then buy the parts and do the upgrades yourself or would you rather just buy it custom shop or customize right out of the box would you just save the money let the pros do the work for you and just buy it out of the box customize or would you, and let's just say it's not, whether you're going to make it a carry gun, competition gun, range toy, whatever. What do you guys think about that? Buying stock and upgrading yourself versus just dropping the money. Do you wish you would have just dropped the money and bought something customized out of the start? What do you guys think about that for handguns? Hell, I, I can't afford that. So, okay. No, it's buy it out of the box, uh, stock, and then put pieces on it as you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I've done very minor upgrades to the handguns on the channel. You know, guide guide rod swap outs for stainless steel models, night side installation. That's pretty much the length of it for me. But uh, would you guys ever just spend the money and get the nice, you know, customized whatever Sig or Glock or get the Performance Center gun? What do you guys think about that? I would say, uh, for me personally, I buy the guns the way they are. Like when I see a rifle or a pistol or whatever. I buy it because that's the exact way that I want it. Now, I mean, adding a scope to it or a bipod, I don't really count that. Uh, but that, that's one of the things that's confused me, especially like when you're talking about the AR packages. People buy this AR, yeah. and then they strip everything off of it and yeah. put a whole bunch of new stuff on it. Well, why didn't you just buy that in the first place? What you need to do is go to Tulsa, where they have the Build-A-Bear AR-15 assembly tables. When you go to the Tulsa Gun Show, you can pick out the parts you want at that point, and they'll assemble the gun for you. And then you just check out at the end of the line, and you've got it exactly how you want it. Cerco receiver done. You know, polymer furniture done. Certain kind of muzzle brake done. You can just just do that. Just go to the Tulsa Gun Show and just just do your buffet line of AR-15 parts, and then just check out and be finished with it. But I that is a good a, point. Yeah. I wonder if a guy could just hire on with them for the day and learn how to build ARs. You know, That'd be or at least assemble <laughs> ARs. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i agree uh david that's kind of funny you would say that because my first ar was just a dpms oracle 556 i bought him like yeah i just want an ar to have one and then slowly over time I upgraded the furniture i upgraded the trigger pack you know i put the i had to put i had to put expensive flip up sights on it because it had the low profile front gas block so i dropped hundred dollars on a midwest industries flip up sight on the front and 89 dollars on the back i had as much in that gun and upgrades as i did in the rifle itself when i bought it uh that's so it's like i should have just this Let's is see, before I, I knew about this is before I knew about PSA and, and buying. This is before we had, you know, like the, the Springfield Sane and the and the MP rifles coming out with you know the furniture already on there. But well, that's what I would say. Just just build if you're gonna if you want to completely customize firearm, whether it's a handgun, rifle, or whatever, just build it. Yeah, and if, it, you know, if you don't have late. if you don't have that's, the capability of building it yourself, then I would say yeah. save up the extra couple bucks and buy it that way. Yeah. Tony, that's what I called my video. It's called I Drank the Magpul Kool-Aid and I took my my stock Bear Creek Arsenal AR and did a full just furniture yeah, swap on it cute. and stuff. I drank the Magpul Kool-Aid and put the new new sights and flip up sights on it and put a nice dot sight on the top. So yeah, yeah, Magpul Kool-Aid. I drank the real Magpul Kool-Aid and I bought a Bushmaster ACR, which means like everything is Magpul on it. That's like, that's the gym with the Jim Jones edition. Is that right? Is that it's, the uh the it's so Magpul <laughs> that the grip textures were actually little Magpul symbols. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that on the uh, on the ACR, right? Yeah, they actually the M is the is the stippling, right? <laughs> yeah, I should have never sold that rifle. That was a great rifle. Oh man, that's just I wish they could have just get them out there for under. What, what what can you pick one up for now? New or used? What are you looking at? Um, thousand. I think they they stopped producing them. Okay, so now they're going to go years ago. Order. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. let me see what's Gun Broker saying. I was going to look them up and see what they had to say. So. Um, uh, just to answer had, a few questions out there real quick. While you look that up, anyway, Tacos and French fries wants to know if I'm going to Tulsa. 
Uh, not going to be able to because I burned my two personal days for work seeing Metallica, unfortunately. So the only way I could go is if I had a uh, if I paid for an out of pocket substitute teacher for my class, which would be uh, about 175 bucks pretty out of my paycheck. So I don't think I'd want to do that. So I want to go to Tulsa, but I might wait. Maybe at some point I'll get a chance to go to SHOT Show. Maybe next year I'll go to SHOT Show instead and burn my personal days on that. I get two per year, and I'm not the kind of person that calls in sick to do stuff around the house. So, yeah, my personal days are done. Love to go to Tulsa again, but I just don't know if it's going to happen. Do I need to get vacation? Does that, yeah, I mean, does I've got something to for... do. That's why I do everything in the summertime, but unfortunately the good trade shows and stuff don't happen in the summer. There's not even any really decent good gun shows that happen in the summertime out here. They're all are you talking over. about? You talking about November or April? Yeah, I won't, I won't be able to do either or unless I take uh, a dock of my paycheck to go, which oh, I can man. do. But I know it's like I had my two days, and I knew when I went to go see Metallica, it was going to be that was okay. So, or, so, so everyone, what we need to do is start a GoFundMe to get Travis to go to Tulsa. <laughs> pay for my substitute GoFundMe campaign. Now I could pay for it out of my paycheck. It would just not be fun to lose, you know, four hundred dollars. So yeah. Okay, uh, prices on Bushmaster ACRs are pretty unanimous on sixteen ninety nine. Uh, I paid a little bit less than that. By a little bit, I mean a lot. Yeah, I could three um, D print my own for less than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it also explode in your hands as soon as you go to shoot it, though. <laughs> but um, you could probably pick them up for a little cheaper because these are all uh, these are all the uh, the basic ones. Um, I bought the enhanced, which came with the aluminum uh, tri <laughs> tri rail hand guards, and it was a little unpleasant to hold with the big tri rail on it. So yeah. Um, but other than that, it's actually pretty uh pretty uh inexpensive for a modern tactical like rifle. Mm -hmm. That's not an AR-15. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I need to toss out a clarifying point on the lever gun topic. Uh oh, go ahead. Uh, the gun like Quigley had the sharps and Stevens crack shot and all those they, while they have a lever under them that opened them, they are not a lever gun. They are a falling block, just to be clear. Well, we better get online and fix the internet about that because that's not what the International Firearms Database calls it. So they call it a high point nine millimeter. I think we need to fix that. Oof. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. Um, all right. So, so again, going back to the idea of customizing versus not, I, personally, I would just buy the parts and do the customization myself. Uh, you, you know, know but what, go ahead, Tony. You know what customization I've done to the last two guns I bought? None. That's, I took a Sharpie and I filled in a little white arrow on the rear sight because it drove me nuts. <laughs> Gunsmithing with Tony. <laughs> yeah, that's I, right, that I did the same thing on my carry gun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's customized just left, just left the uh, front dot now there is another option if you want to get something somewhat like if you've ever wanted a gun in a particular color David you probably know about this one a lot of times Ruger and, and other companies do the uh, I don't know if it's Tallow or Talo editions that's what my SIG is it's got mine doesn't have the Cerakote but they do a lot of Cerakote colors uh, they have a special uh, you know custom grips that they install on the, on the firearms themselves so you ever looked at any, any of those David my Vaqueros are Talo Oh, the yeah, they, it's it's a lot of it is that they're sold through Davidson's. Uh, they're I think they're a Taylo exclusive distributor, but I've seen Taylo guns show up on other websites too, um, like other other gun distributors. But I think they might be an exclusive uh, for, for local, Davidson's. Yeah, my local had them because I bought yeah. them there. They if they get them from Davidson's, they do offer those those versions, and a lot of a lot of gun stores will keep them in stock. But yeah, yeah, I tend to uh, be kind of boring, I guess, because. Okay. You know, like like the Ruger. If I, I want to buy a Ruger Ranch, and I like the green, mm -hmm. tannish whatever color the stock is. So this one's they call it they call it FDE. It's more of a green, less of a less less of a coyote or whatever you want to call it. It's more of a a darker. It's weird because when you see it in the photos, it's a lot lighter than it is in the pictures. Back yeah, in the day, we know. it's almost like a grayish tan, actually, almost like a clay. Yeah, and then obviously, you know, our scary black rifles. Mm -hmm. I like them to be scary and black. That's right, man. I did do uh, OD green on the Bear Creek over here, and it, I like the I like the contrast of the green with the black. That's the only gun I've got that on, but I do normally agree with you on that. Just keep it simple, you know. 
Oh, come on. You didn't want to put the, uh, the construction worker orange furniture kit on your AR. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that's obnoxious. He's got I can't that believe one. they even offer that. I mean, that blows my mind. What? Unless you want to. Wait, they've like got an orange furniture kit for the AR. Oh, wait, yeah. I got to look for this. There's a blaze orange magpul kit. They do blaze orange. They do, uh, pink. Well, they might even do the Tiffany teal color or whatever. Not that I look, but does, yeah, you can the get blaze, it. Brown else carries it. Yeah. Does the blaze orange come for an AR 10 platform? How much of that's interchangeable? I uh, know. I think it's just strictly for the AR-15. Because you could take that deer hunting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I had a five-round magazine. Yeah. <laughs> With the Blaze Orange furniture on it. So, I yeah, they offer. Don't worry about you people's sanity. <laughs> no, Tony, we're trying to tell people not to go that route. That's what we're trying to do. Man, they make a, they make the uh, Remington 870 furniture kit in Blaze Orange also. Magpul does that. Yeah, so there you go. If you want to customize, you can get the blaze orange. You can get the bright pink. You can get your, you know, <laughs> for that guy who's ever, for that guy who's dropped his shotgun in the grass and couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. It makes it easier to to spot. It makes you easier to spot, right? Which is what you Stay want. Brown elves. Yeah, I'm probably I, a little bit on the side of old school here, but your gun should be either a plum brown, b blue, with wood furniture, or c nickel with wood. Furniture. Your stainless well, steel will make an effective substitute. My friend has the uh, Remington 870 shotgun, and it's got the old wooden stock on it. And every single day, he talks about putting that black composite stock on there and taking the wood off. And I tell him every single time he says, it, just buy a new one and sell me this one. Don't do that. Because when I look at his shotgun, it's got that nice wood stock on it. It's just, it, that's the way it should look. You know, if you if you want the black tactical shotgun, just go buy one, or let him do it, David, and then just buy the wood furniture off of him. No, I didn't think about that. <laughs> there you, you go, you, man. You spend less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have seen. Be... Go ahead. I'm supposed to be inheriting the late '50s 870 from my dad, and if I do, I will buy new wood furniture to put on. Because it's just battered. I mean, it was a gun that got used. Yeah. And keep the old stuff around, but still, there's nothing wrong with going new if you want to. Yeah, I ain't going to throw the yeah. freaking wood on it in the fire or nothing. Yeah. Just yeah. Replace I want the gun restored to new condition and passing it on to my grandkids. Yeah. I've thought about doing that with my dad's Remington 788 rifle, but to pick up a, a even a beat to crap 788 to refinish the wood on it is 460 bucks. Any place I've found them. Yeah. You can buy the wood from like, uh, who the hell is it? Boyd's. Uh, yeah, but that's over half the price of the whole gun. So why wouldn't <laughs> I get why wouldn't I get the barrel and the action and the bolt and everything with it? Yep. Now Georgia yeah. Trucker says uh, Cerakote, the black rifles are pink and yellow, so they're not so scary. There you go. Purple furniture, purple furniture is popular, glaze orange, right? Um yeah, by the way, guys, those of you out in the chat, if you ever have any questions, just go ahead and post your questions out there on either the YouTube or gun channel side. We can definitely answer those for you. Uh, you know, I guess I guess what I would say with the customization thing is if you know you want a Serico, you know you want a custom barrel, before you buy the gun, you know you're gonna do an aftermarket trigger, then just buy the just buy the nice, you know, custom model so the work is already done for you. Many times you get a warranty or a guarantee with that too, or sometimes if you fiddle with the gun yourself, uh, you could lose your warranty coverage or you could end up injuring yourself if you're not careful. Well, um, there is a certain segment of the population that wants a gun that's theirs. Yeah. Nobody else yeah. has got one like it. Yep. And yep. I, I'm neither here nor there on that particular concept. You know, if that's what you want, that's fine. Yeah. Which is why I don't really hack on people for customizing. Mm -hmm. You want to do it? And yeah. Fine. Go right ahead. If you want to get some nice engraving done or you want to get that, that certain kind of barrel or you want to get that Cerakote finish or you want to get that stippling or you want to get that whatever flared magwell installation you know do it i bought a gun because my gun shop couldn't even get some bits for over a year it's so hard to get a hold of one and i bought it sight unseen just to get it mm -hmm. and that's that 4570 which is why it had you know maybe bluing issues that i had already paid for before seeing it was it new tony yeah okay okay yeah, they waited over a year to get one from their distributor. And they had to list the guys that wanted to look at it. I'm like, well, I'm going to look at it. I'll buy it. Pay for it right now. 
did you ever think about sending it in to get the finish examined or get it to get it refinished from the factory because you weren't happy with it? I don't care that much. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use the gun, so it's going to get dinged anyway. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, you know, what's, what's, what does it matter if you're going to be not really tossing it around, but just shooting it? It's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be the tool. It's going to get used, you know? It's actually been more fun to hand it to somebody and let them shoot it than it is to shoot the thing myself. Oh yeah. Like with a uh, night strike. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's like when squib, when squib it was, shoot it was the really hand fun to shoot uh, Tony's uh, lever actions. And uh, I, I even shot, I think, was it one of your uh, revolvers? Yeah, I had them. Uh, yeah, two eighteen seventy fives out. I don't know. I, I let I, anybody shoot forty fours or not. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I shot. I shot. I shot one of the revolvers. I don't know which one it was, but it was fun regardless. I had. I, I enjoyed shooting those guns. Period. Yeah. And that was the point. I mean, I didn't bring them down there for myself to shoot. I can do that shit here. It was too bad it was cold. Yeah, it was a little chilly. It was a little chilly there. <laughs> a little, little, little bit of snow in April in Oklahoma. No, right? Never no, heard of. Never no, heard this, of. Is, this, is on the, this is on Thursday before we went to J.M. Davis. Yeah. Yeah, it this wasn't is, quite is, uh, as cold as it was Saturday. No, you Saturday got really hot. You rain. mean when it snowed Friday night? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. All right, so guys, we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and move on to the last topic, and this is kind of a, kind of a joke, but it's also kind of a serious one. This is a I swear to God, this is a topic that that was a viewer request. The question is, what do you do with your concealed carry weapon when you have to use the restroom? We're assuming we're talking about using a stall. Number two, um, you know, it's funny. Colio Noir made a video. One of the first videos I ever watched from Colio Noir. He talked about how we need advocates out there. We need a movement to cater to us concealed carriers because when we go to use the restroom, there isn't necessarily a place for you to safely stow your firearm. And depending on how you carry it, if you've got just a clip on holster or not. So I just want to kind of pick your brains a little bit. Those of you that do conceal carry, maybe Sandals, you can chime in on this or anybody else that does. Uh, what do you do with that, with that handgun when you got to, when you've got to use the restroom? I, uh, when I appendix carry and I yeah. carry in a soft holster. So when I am in that situation, I just hang on to the, gun holster in my pants belt yeah while i'm doing business yeah yeah i think there needs to be there we're definitely we're definitely there's a lack of support for those of us that are concealed carriers i like to have a nice you know safe stove shelf installed in public restrooms everywhere so that i can uh you know have a safe place to stow it so except, bathroom except for oh go ahead tony go ahead i, said, I was just gonna say the <laughs> That you could set the gun on, but I still wouldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, when I'm in public, that gun's supposed to be under my control. Period. I take yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. don't set it down any place where you can walk away from it. Forget it. That's what I was gonna say. What this about what about the hook on the back of the door? Like you hang your jacket and stuff. No, like. bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Seems legit. I see the well, cop. I could see It'll him. be safe. It'll be safe. <laughs> yeah. I could see I how it would be a bad cop. idea because there was a teacher that shot herself uh, using the restroom. She sat down and her gun went off. She was she was a licensed concealed carrier for the school she taught in. And so uh, I was hoping after that that there would be a solid movement to take care of those of us that are concealed carriers catering to our needs in the restroom because everybody else does. Why not us? Right. What were we saying, man? Well, I could I could see, you know, obviously the danger of hooking it on there and the gun going off. But aside from that, you know, having like a little shelf or a holster spot next to the, next to the throne. Yeah. <laughs> you, I, I'm sure you'd have people that would get up and, you know, leave and forget to yeah. grab their weapon. And then the next joker that comes in is like, Oh, not only do I get TP, I get a firearm too. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the remember the Godfather? That revolver was right behind the toilet, you know. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, where'd this come from? The thirty eight special. Um, I, and just a, a side note on that, you know, if you guys are into the button fly jeans, hell, they're a problem. Just using a urinal. I don't know. I haven't worn button fly jeans since nineteen ninety three, but I mean. I, <laughs> If you do, if you do, it's it's something to consider. And you know, that's that's another thing too, is if you do need to 
you know, I'm, I take loosen your belt, you know, for whatever situation, that weight of that gun is going to be pulling, depending if you outside waistband, inside waistband carry, it's going to put some weight on it and it could put you in kind of an awkward situation. So you may need to practice going to the restroom before you start concealed carrying the first couple times. Uh, keep that in consideration. Me, I'm a three to five o'clock carry person. I've been moving more towards the three. So I do have the bell clip with the, the Kydex holster and it's locked onto the bell, but you do have to carefully lower right the, uh, the the holster so that it doesn't flop, you know, fall off when the gun falls out or whatnot. Um, yeah, but that's it would just, be nice to have something, you know. That's just a matter of building the habit to where you, you hold yeah. on to your belt at that spot. Yes, yes, this is true. So, it's, you know, go, going up or down either uh, way. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, if if you're at the far, you know, depending on if you're right-handed or left-handed, if, if you're at the, you know, the far end or whatever, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of the time you can kind of just look around and see, hey, is this even something that somebody could, you know, reach underneath the sidewall or something uh, or is even visible? Um, half the time I don't worry about it. You know, you're in a little little uh, public bathroom, you know, and and there's only one stall and there's a wall up against you. You know, I mean, that's not an issue. Otherwise, the safest thing that I've ever found is um, pop it out of the holster and just drop it, you know, inside your your trousers or whatever, you know, right in front of you. It's it's still under your control. Nobody no, knows it's there, and you're not going to walk off without it. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Uh, just be just be careful. You know, it's not going to have the trigger guard protected. But yeah, yeah. Um, that, back yeah. to the hook. I, back to the hook question. Locally here, as far as I know, there was a cop. I think and it's been a while since I've read this. Who hooked his Beretta on the coat hook in the back of the door? And when he went to get it, he emptied the friggin' magazine into the ceiling. Oh. <laughs> wow. God. <laughs> uh, yeah. Basically, bump fired itself. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> bump fired. <laughs> how, that, how about that's going to be illegal soon? Yep. How how about when you're out in public with your firearm, you just don't take a number two? You do your business before you leave the house or after you get home? You know, sometimes those chili dogs come calling. Yeah. Not sometimes, always an option, Squib. Yeah. Sometimes it happens. Oh God. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, I've oh, I've wow. had to do my business in some some really rough places. Uh, especially being out in the field and whatnot, but um, yep, yep, yep. yeah, I avoid because you don't know what you're going to get. I don't want to <laughs> sanitary wipes. You ever notice that everybody yeah. in public, whenever you're in a restroom, everybody has diarrhea in that restroom except for you. You ever notice that? Yeah. Yeah. This oh is what God. I'm getting at. So <laughs> I just say, I just say, you know, try to plan your movements yes. around your, your, your concealed yes. carry. Know what you're gonna yeah, eat. You know, know how it's gonna affect you two hours later. Okay. Yeah. As far as number one, if you've got to take it off to do number one, then you you, you uh, okay. Uh, I don't see <laughs> that, but whatever. Go buy yourself a pair of five hundred ones and try it, Squib. Hey, okay, squib. Okay, no. It doesn't says. matter if they button or zip. It doesn't matter if they button or zip. <laughs> Georgia. Oh, now, here's here's the thing. Though. If yeah, go if ahead. You, go ahead. If you've got to move it to, to do number one, you might just consider not using the urinal. Don't. You might consider going into a stall, move it, do the same yeah. thing. If, you, there's, if you've there's got no to shame. move it to do number one, then don't carry it like that. <laughs> well, that too. I, I don't, I don't, I can't myself. So, <laughs> uh, Squib, somebody said that you've obviously never had truck stop food before. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know you the, thing is, the thing is, the thing is, when I'm out on the road, gravy, you throw down some biscuits about an hour later. It's like your butt, your your intestines say to you, "Okay, it's on, bro. You're going down." When I'm <laughs> when I'm out on the road, I actually have to consider that. I have to say, yep. "Do I want to deal with yep. this later today while I'm out on the road or not?" And you know, how bad it, do I want that baconator and that order of onion rings? You know, how bad? Yeah, do I really not that bad. bad. <laughs> Sorry, not that bad. Let me put this number one thing to rest here. Now, I defy anybody to put on a pair of button fly jeans that actually fit them and unbutton any of the lower buttons and button them back without unfastening the top. One. You can't. You can't. It's like it's painful, man. I can. It's, it's dangerous. It's... All right. I mean, I, maybe that second from the bottom. Uh, okay, okay now, 
that very this, butt one, the very bottom one. I just remember when I was a kid, it was very difficult to get that to fasten, you know. And yeah, these this, pants were in my size; they were husky. But uh, yeah, this this may take this down a different rabbit hole. But oh, is any is anybody selling button fly jeans other than Levi Strauss? Oh. Who yeah, I, will I haven't, not I haven't buy worn jeans buttonfly from anymore. jeans in decades. I haven't I worn them in decades. Them, but I think we yeah. need to make buttonfly jeans. Great. I, 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 I understand if, if your buttonflies are grandfathered in, you already own them. But I would hope that uh, nobody wants to deal with Levi's for a while at least. Okay, so anybody so if you're born after 1996 of... might not realize that buttonfly jeans were the thing for men back in the day. Um, right, they were. That's why I haven't worn them in so long. But if, you're, if, you, can't, if you can't unbutton them, then get one with a zipper. <laughs> There's five on ones are There's still popular. They just companies don't. that make button fly jeans. Okay. Oh Excuse my god, we're turning into fashion east of Chad now. Come on, let's take it back to poop. Let's take it back to where it needs to be. Okay. <laughs> did, did anybody else have the t-shirt that said? Bring it back to number two. Huh? <laughs> did anybody else have the t-shirt that said "button your fly"? Oh yeah, the Levi shirt. Yeah, I wouldn't do it now <laughs> because Levi's doesn't believe in a person's right to protect themselves. Yeah. Back in the day, yeah, man. Levi's advertised so heavily on MTV, you you could you had to be a fly. Levi's used to have some really cool TV ads back in the eighties. Yeah, people singing and stuff. Uh, the the really five hundred one cool blues. blues. Remember the kid playing on the the kid playing on the bucket with his uh, sticks. He was playing in the subway. That there's an acoustic percussion kid that it was a five hundred one commercial. They used to show people doing their talents. There's a guy that would juggle. I don't know, man. Levi's had some crazy marketing back in the nineties, and uh, looks like half our chat decided to go ahead and leave. And come on, was it the poop chat that drew you away? Oh, they're back. Did, yes, did they're you back. hit the button, Travis? <laughs> I did not touch anything. You mm. guys are back. He hit the new poop, button. So. Travis yeah. hit the button. He's... No, I'm going to – here, let me hit the button right now. We'll just go ahead and mute Night Strike. Now I hit the button. Uh. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. You! Better. All right, man. Love you like a brother, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, right. okay, I guess did we even give anybody any advice? So, first of all, practice a couple times. Yes, we gave them fashion advice. Out. Do not get button fly jeans. They're yes. outdated. I, so I gave that, advice. Hold on to your firearm as you lower your trousers, okay, before you do your business. If there's a shelf in there and you feel safe and it's secure, set your firearm in there if you need to. Uh, try not to use the code hook if at all possible because, as they said in the chat on the YouTube side, it is a rate-increasing device now, so it's going to be right. banned. Now, hey, you know what, guys? I do have a question from the Gun Channel side. Oh, Let's please. go ahead and get away from pooping and back what, to some actual... Potty training with <laughs> Travis? Uh, no. I still can't condone the shelf thing because what if the guy next to you bumps the divider and, and shakes the whole oh, divider dang. shakes your shelf? Do you really then, want that thing falling off? I no, cannot definitely condone not. that. It's a Glock. It's I, gonna break. I, um, I, don't know, I don't know if anybody heard it, but what I had said earlier is shuck it out of the holster, put it down in your pants in front of you, and uh, just be careful with it. But that's the only real safe way to do it that I have found. You know, yes. and there's another reason why sometimes carrying without one round in the chamber or having an external safety might be a good idea. If you're prone to drop in this because you can't control your bowel movements and you've got to go constantly <laughs> in public, you might not want to have it in a condition where if it falls, <laughs> it might go off. Or if you hang it on a hook, what the hell? From the trigger, you're going to pull the trigger. Or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe having something as simple as a magazine disconnect, which people can't stand. If it's as simple as just dropping the mag and the damn gun won't fire, take the mag out. I mean, there these safeties are there for a reason. You might not use them constantly, but for inconvenient issues like this, those things might come in handy. I don't know. No, just that's, that's, that's not the only reason why I said that's I don't want the thing though. getting knocked off a shelf, though. It, it's got nothing to do with whether or not I trust my safety. I've dropped my pistol before and... and in the holster, you know, on the bedroom floor, and, and it's it's okay, but I don't want it, number one, I don't want it to, uh, uh, you know, mar the finish or, or damage anything. I also don't want it to hit the tile on the bathroom floor or, worse yet, bounce off my foot and go skittering outside the stall or to the what next stall. What if it goes stall? into the toilet? What if you bump oh. it when you get up? We're big guys. Sometimes those stalls are tiny. You bump it with your shoulder, boop, it's just oh, in there. And you've got yeah. Lincoln Logs going on here. <laughs> so what I want to know is, has anybody, been, oh. has anybody been in a stall in a public restroom and yeah. they hear something hit the floor and they kind of look down and there's a Glock sitting in the middle of the stall where you can see it next to the guy's foot? I right? definitely don't look under the stall. I've been, I've been in. I've been in. <laughs> I don't mean stick your head underneath the stall. I'm just well, saying, I mean, you know, to see what it is, I got to look, right? <laughs> Yeah, I've been in public. You know, look at an angle. Bro. I don't know how to explain it. Oh man, God! I never thought <laughs> have, it would be so have you? To talk about. 
Huh? Have you had that experience, Squib? I've never had uh, somebody drop something that I could see without having to stick my head underneath the door that was a <laughs> firearm. I've seen people drop cell phones. Yeah, uh, that's, that's people drop I keys. I've had people next uh, to me drop stuff I didn't want to see. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are you strangling a mongoose over there? What are you doing, bro? <laughs> I think we can all admit that none of us want to pick anything up off the public bathroom floor. No, no. No, that's yeah, not always too. a good idea to have sandy wipes with you at all times and some uh, Germex. Sometimes Germex. I just feel like Germex burning my shoes even. And seal oh, yeah. So, oh my God. so is a bottle of Purell going to be in the EDC now? Yes, it will be. It yes. will be. You just got to make sure you have a disposable um, packet of hey, it, right? Get, get, get the Purell with the halo in it. I'm going to invent a new product, Lysol gun oil. It is a not-so-sanitary moments in life. You have little, like, little prowl-sized cans of it you can buy in Walmart next to the travel toothpaste and stuff. Right. We should, we should you? <laughs> Tony, here's the product you need. <laughs> what, what you need to invent, Tony, is just a little canned air, but call it sanitary air. Sanitary air. Sandy for, air. For, <laughs> Sandy air for, for blasting toilet water out of your barrel. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> oh man oh man oh geez okay so the 39 people watching now probably have lost their appetite for breakfast so um we have a question over on the gun channel side believe it or not paper patrick asked this question and and this could be sacrilege here he says question for everyone on the panel he honestly wants an answer for this free-floated handguards in mlock or key mod for lever guns good to go or sacrilege and Home defense rifle in place of AR in states where you're not allowed to own an AR or you first can't off, easily get an AR. Go ahead. First off, you need to go wash your mouth out for even suggesting such a thing on lever gun. No, no, no. He's, it's just a question. It's just an honest question. Patrick was curious. He just because you know somebody might want the the accessorization part of having M lock. Maybe you want to put a flashlight on it, or you want to put a vertical fork grip, or I mean, it would be making you know cycling pretty cool and easy if you had a vertical fork grip. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I would say it's sacrilegious. I would just leave it as is. I mean, just even the thought of me putting the synthetic stocks on the, uh, 336, I feel like I'm committing some kind of a gun sin, you know, scope instead of keeping the wood sin. stocks on there. What's that? The scope is a sin. Oh, come on, Tony. This came on it, man. It's got, it's got, it has, a, it wasn't tapped for a rail. I mean, it's pre-tapped from the factory for a rail. That's the only reason why the scope is on there. I would never have that done. You know, it came that way. It should have think, a long, shiny brass tube. Uh, the thing is, Tony, I'm looking at possibly taking this thing out to 200 yards for a deer hunt. I want to make sure I can do it the right way. So I guess I got to kind of throw original layout to the wind and go with something that's going to be a little more functional for hunting purposes. That's just my opinion. It also depends on the model of the lever rifle. If it's a Marlin or uh, uh, which Winchester is it that has the side eject? You're fine, but some of those old, you know, 94s and, and 73s, they they eject up the top. <laughs> Yeah, they make tip offs for those. You can okay. Yeah, I no, this. Um, yeah, I'm I'm leaving the scope on mine. I'm not going to take it off. I, it's it's nice. It's accurate. It's going to help me. I mean, I honestly, I would not feel confident taking a 200 yard shot on a deer with iron sights. Not with my eyes, as old as I am now. I would definitely want optics just to shoot the animal humanely. You know, to drop it humanely. So. I was just kidding anyway. I don't care. Oh, okay. Well, no, I'm just saying you say it. I'm going to take it like it's a piece of advice. You know, I mean, I, um, but anyway, yeah, let's Patrick, let's leave the free floated hand guard. Let's, let's not tack to cool out the lever gun. Give it the respect it deserves. Keep it as is. Maybe put an optic on the top, you know, is he asking about using one for home defense. No. And then also would you consider the lever gun as a home defense firearm in a place where maybe you can't easily get a traditional semi-automatic AR-15? It would be a poor choice in my opinion. Why is that? I mean, it's a nice short length. It's a nice stout round. You've got, I don't know how many rounds on standby. I mean, what, what's the capacity on that thing? Anyway, I don't even know. Even in 30, 30, that round's pretty damn stout for being in your house. One thing. I mean, you might have some better options. I mean, you. you but what if it's a uh, pistol caliber carbine? Yeah, what, what if it's a big boy or something like a 44 or a 357 lever gun? That's still pretty damn stout for being in your house. Okay, it, it would be. That's what you want, though. You want to be able to drop the assailant with one shot. I mean, that's what you're going to want. But here's, you know? here's the thing. Now, if you're actually inside the house, then I still say that a handgun is probably the best thing. Um, now, if, if you've got a couple acres of property or something, and, and you know, maybe you've got 
coyotes that come up and bother your dog or your cats or something like that, and that's kind of what you're thinking of, then, you know, if you're outside, that's a little bit different story. I don't like any kind of rifle for inside the house if I can avoid it, but at the same time... You know, let's be frank, a lever action is not the fastest action out there. No. Yeah, this is true. This is certainly fast. Connor's that question now. Come on. If you want a... uh, yeah, we talked about that before we went live. Yeah, yeah. His, his finger didn't actually hit that trigger ever when he did that. Um, but uh, now I still think if you want a long gun or a shoulder-fired gun for inside a house, I still think that a Remington 870 or Mossberg 500, a good pump-action shotgun, is the way to go. I would kind of second that one. Travis, Plus, you got a super if- chat. If you've got somebody in Buying your house, LCP for first gun and CCW, yay or nay, everyone, let's run it through the panel. Ruger LCP. Ew. Uh, okay, so there's AWAG's answer. David, what do you think? Uh, I'm <laughs> going to go thumbs up. Gun? Just I'd an original LCP 380. Uh, My daughter's know, got one and she does not like it at all. I would say the biggest complaint that people, I've never fired one, but is it a really heavy trigger? Is it hard to. To shoot it accurately, it's what 380, right? Now, are we Street talking trigger. LCP or LCP2 yeah. as well? This or says just... LCP because the thing is, the LCPs are showing up for about 170 bucks <laughs> on PSA. They keep advertising them for I think 169, and a lot of people are buying them. I've read a few horror stories about reliability and reviews, but you never know if that's true or not. Um, if it's got that long, heavy self defense trigger pull with the 380, you might be looking at a snappy, uncomfortable gun. Now, it's not going to matter in a self defense situation, but David, would you buy one? As a CCW or not? No, no it's just no. It's not not okay. as a CCW. Uh, I'd bump up to the nine millimeter if I was gonna really uh, put my life on it and yeah. say this is what's gonna protect my life. I'd bump up to the nine millimeter. Yeah, a dog dad for not much more. You can get yourself what I'm actually put a down payment on was the uh, Ruger EC9S, which we said was the LCP nine. S is that right? Sandhills. I guess I haven't looked much. I haven't done much research into it, but the, yeah, there's a difference in the there's a difference in the frame size and the length of the okay between the LCP and the LC9. It's not much, but it's definitely different. Yeah, the uh, the EC9 is the LC9S. The EC9S is the cheaper version of it. So it's two hundred twenty bucks. Dog dad, you're only looking at about sixty dollars more for a nine millimeter. Granted, you only get one magazine with it. You got a seven plus one capacity, but get a much better purchase on the gun. Way better trigger. In fact, that's the same trigger that's used in the uh, the Ruger Security 9, if I'm not mistaken, and the LC9S. You guys can correct mm-hmm. me on that if I'm wrong. Yes. But the trigger is supposed to be very nice. Uh, you got the little pinky extension on it if you want it. So I personally, I'm going to say no. I don't know. Uh, Sandhills, what would you say? Or nice strike, what would you say? We'll just go down the list real quick. LCP, CCW, yay or nay? I'm going to say no. Go up to the yeah. LC9S or get the EC9S, whichever one you want to get. You can get yeah. both of them. They still sell both of them. But yeah. uh, I, I'm i not a fan of the 380. I mean, it's it's a novel round, but unfortunately, I'm not a fan of it. I was looking at getting a uh, one of the, uh, what is it, the uh, the P238? Oh, yeah. yeah. Or is it yeah. the P938? Or you know, the, 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 the the SIG one, but it was in 380, and I was really hoping it would have been – they had one in you know, 45 or something, but they didn't. They only had it in 380, and I'm like, I really don't want to trust my life with, yeah. you know, four, 380. So, you know, yeah. go, go up to your, – your minimum, the, the smallest caliber minimum I would recommend would be 9 millimeter. Okay. Don't go any lower than 9. All right. Sandhills, what do you think? Can, now I'm on my phone. I can't see the chat. Can you oh. reread that question for me? LCP I, for a daily carry, yay or nay? Ruger LCP chambered is, in three. Is that what it was, or one. was there talking there of of a first LCP gun? Two. Uh, it just says for first, first gun CCW. and CCW. Now, if it's a first gun, no, absolutely oh. not. Get something that that you're actually going to be able to learn how to shoot on. Now, if you know how to shoot, that's one thing. If if you're going to go buy an LCP and learn how to shoot with that. You're not going to like to shoot, and you're not going to practice, and you're not going to want to carry it. Um, yeah. I now, if if it's in 380, I'm not scared of it. Just spend some money and buy some honey badger rounds. Those have the Lee, Lehigh, uh, whatever they are, the 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 fluted rounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I've seen good things in testing in in the 380 from that, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. 
Um, so if yeah, it's a first yeah. gun, uh, my vote is no. However, what's the first rule in a gunfight? Have a gun. Yeah. So if it's all you can afford and you want to carry something, then something's better than nothing. At least you don't have to find a pointy stick or a rock. You know, so, you're gonna have you're gonna have trouble at that price point for 160 bucks, short of a high point, you're gonna have trouble finding a new I mean that and that the high points to me it's not you can conceal it, but I wouldn't I would realistically conceal it. But if you want a con gun, you'd be looking at say a Taurus. You could um, conceal it. I couldn't. The, yeah, no, what I'm saying is that if you wanna if you want a compact uh daily carry gun, it's gonna be hard to find one for 169 bucks that they're selling them for online, you know. No, no, not to dress anybody down, but I've seen a lot of different forums, a lot of different questions, a lot of different chats where somebody said, what do you think about this gun? And then everybody starts saying, get this gun, get this gun, get this gun. Yeah. It doesn't answer the question. So to, to answer the question on the LCP, if you know how to shoot, then it's better than nothing. If you don't know how to shoot, I'm not going to recommend that you learn on a pocket pistol because you're not going to be able to learn all of the correct mechanics yeah. That will, you know, you, you learn on something that fits your hand, you're going to, you're going to be able to apply that to any gun, even the little ones, you can shoot them better after you know how to shoot one that fits your hand, right? And it's so, less of an issue, but 380 ammo tends to be a little bit pricey too. You usually pay about five bucks more per box. And, and those made. tiny little pocket guns tend to be kind of yeah. snappy. Yeah, they are. So if, if you know how to shoot then, and, and you want to, you know, get that because it's what you can afford right now, then I'm, I say go with it. It's a, it's a pocket sized gun. Mm -hmm. And I think if you go up to the EC9, I think that you most people can't put it in a pocket. You're then you're looking at belt holster and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so to answer the question, it, it's kind of a two part answer. It's a yes and a no, but uh, it wouldn't be what I would recommend. But it, it's still better than not having no a gun, gun at all. Yeah. If yeah, so hopefully that kind of answers the question that was asked. I think that the 380, and this is just once again my opinion, the way I feel about it. Uh, the 380 is just a gun to have in your collection. I'm I'm gonna go get one. I'll probably end up getting two of them because I'm looking at a Bursa as well. But it's not something that I'm going to you know champion as my favorite gun, or it's just gonna be like everybody's already said. It's a cheap gun that you can afford easy, and just to have one. But I agree totally with Night Strike as well. Nine millimeter is the lowest I'd go if I'm putting my life on the line. You yeah, know, so I, I was reading. Thank you. I'm <laughs> one that's cool that any gun's better than no gun. Well, yeah, I, of course. A, a but if you have the option, is, if that's what you have, carry it. I that, carry knives in my pocket, so that's you know something is always better than nothing. But right, if no, it doesn't I've been sound reading. like a person in the chats a something or nothing, I think he's got the option to make some choices. I uh, I've been reading gun magazines since the early '90s, and back then. A lot of guys didn't even like nine millimeter, but the the uh, advancements in ammo in the last twenty years have come so far that it's pretty well um, widely accepted that three eighty is kind of your base caliber now. Because um, yeah, I mean you can defend yourself with the twenty two; it's not ideal. Clearly, you're going to have to probably put more holes in somebody with a twenty two long rifle than you are with with a you know forty five. I mean, if that's all just, you've got. If that's all you've got. But if that's what you've got, that's what you've got. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, the, they are the, the newer 380 rounds that are designed for self-defense. The shorter are definitely, guys, they for shorter barrel They're definitely a lot more yeah. effective than, you know, even 9 millimeter ball was 20 years ago. So, and the gun, you know, the people are, the manufacturers, they're building the guns for these rounds, you know, a little bit better now too. So the, the biggest thing is with something that mm -hmm. tiny, um, you know, 380 being a kind of a shorter case length that I think those kind of feed better with that, uh, steeper, you know, feed ramp angle. So yeah. I think that makes kind of a difference too. Um, just make sure whatever you get that you, you shoot your carry ammo extensively and make sure that it's not going to, oh, yeah. it's not going to fail because carry ammo does not perform inside your gun the way that ball does very often. Yeah. There has been a, okay, we've got a couple suggestions out here in the chat, Smith and Wesson, uh, 5906 for 300 bucks. Tours G2C for two hundred and eleven dollars out the door. Yeah, you can get those for like two oh nine. Uh, Midnight Range makes a pretty good point. He says, you know, three eighty will work. Or no, uh, Midnight Range says over the life of the gun, the three eighty gun is cheaper, but nine millimeter ammo prices will balance out the cost. What are SDs going for now? 
Now, Clover Tack has made a comment. He says, I will put someone flat on the ground with my Glock 42 and 380. Period. No exceptions, no doubt. 380 is way more capable in real world applications than most people admit. Uh, ballistic gel feels no pain. You know, yeah, critical defense rounds. I've seen it perform pretty close to coming into the 13 uh, inch penetration depth on, on gel. Yeah, uh, Tony, your question about the SD9 VE. Um, they're 249 around the time of Black Friday. Otherwise, I know 299 around the time of Black Friday is what I remember seeing SD9 VEs for. Uh, you know, larger gun about the size of a Glock 19. And um, otherwise, I'm seeing like 350 locally is what one one's going to cost me out the door. Real quick, Dog, Dog Dad has a $5 super chat. Uh, looked at the PT-111 heavily, but a safety between me and my life as a newbie. Truthfully scares me. like what I see in other guns, but then I see a safety. Um, you know, Can I jump in Dad, on this one? Well, real quick, Dog Dad, that's why I consider the uh, car CT-9. That's why that's my daily carry because it has no safety other than just the trigger safety. I mean, it's not, it doesn't even have a blade safety on it. Just the drop safety, firing pin safety, and the safety between your ears. Squib, go. Okay, so here's the thing. Whether you want the safety on the trigger or you want an external safety or you want three safeties on the gun or you want none at all, you want to remove every safety. It's about personal preference. Having an external safety is something that you just learn how to use. I don't know how many Bingo. people are like, it's going to break. It's not going to function. I'm not going to be able to flip it off when I, when I draw. I'm not going to practice. Use it. That's all you got to do. Or just leave the damn thing off. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. just go on on its own, just like the gun doesn't go off on its own. If you're, if you're scared about a gun with a safety, then either one, just don't use the safety, or two, buy one without a safety. If you keep but here's the other thing, Night Strike. Look at what you just safe. said. You said scared. And did he say that in his super no. chat? I'm sorry. Did no. he say no. scared? No, no, no. Scared. He does, he does, no, no, no. Wait, Night Strike. He, he did say that. It. Okay. Hold it, hold it. No, he did say the word scares. And and guys, this is something that when you got a newbie in there and you're going to accuse them of being afraid of their gun, even if they accuse themselves of being afraid of their gun, you need to look at what that means psychologically and what that does to our community. I'm not saying you should be reckless with your gun. Absolutely not. Be safe. No. Be, be, you know, be safety conscious. We know the four rules of firearm safety and stuff like that. But right. whether it doesn't have a safety or it does have a safety. Don't let that be something that scares you. And don't let somebody say, oh, you got a safety on a gun. You, you must be scared. Or, oh, you're not carrying with around in the chamber this time. You must be scared. Or, oh, you got a smaller caliber. You must be scared. No, a lot of this stuff really comes down to personal preference. If you have this, this notion that you've got to be the fastest draw in the world and you don't want anything between you and pulling the trigger, then get something without a safety, I guess. That's your personal preference. But you can actually have a safety on the firearm and learn how to operate it. And it's not going to slow you down one iota. It's just a matter of practice. And, but if you don't want one, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times I jump into this whole external safety and then I joke around about the whole, you know, I'm not going to buy a Glock until they make one of the external safety. I like them, but that's how I was trained. It doesn't mean that my way is right. It just means it's one of several ways. So find what works right for you. If having that external safety is a deal breaker, then don't buy one. But if, if you really want the gun and it comes with it, practice. That's all you got to do. Right. I'm just saying, I, bought, I bought my car CT9 because it didn't have one, and I just wanted something where I can draw and pull the trigger if I need to. I mean, I'm not – I know, I, I, I know. You can train, and I have carried guns with safeties before, and you can get used to it, and you can train yourself to make sure that as you draw that you, that you click it off or you click it off immediately once you – Get a proper purchase on it. So, I mean, I don't disagree with you guys at all. I just when think I got, that I carry doesn't CCW, have one. The first gun I carried was, you know, my 1911, the full size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's, so, it, it's heavy, but it's got it's got a safety on it. But it's it's got two safeties, you it's know, got two safeties. safeties, and and a manual safety. And I wasn't scared of it because with the with with the 1911, it's cocked and locked. That's how you that's how you carry it. That's how you're yep. supposed to carry it. Now. That, when, that, that, didn't, when that we, didn't scare me. That didn't bother me. That just told me that when, when I'm ready to use it, I have to take the safety off. And as Squibb says, you got to train yourself for that. You know, and after that, at, you know, some guy, the guys got together and, you know, helped me get a P320. And I was looking for the P320 with the manual safety because they do make it with the manual safety. But I ended up getting one without the manual safety because I just figured, you know what? I'm not scared of a safety. A safety isn't going to prevent me from you know saving my life the only thing that's gonna prevent me from saving is my life is 
not pulling the trigger. And see, I hear a lot of that in the community, whether people label themselves that way or other people start just jumping on somebody and scared, 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 scared. That's not a good way to get newbies into the community or keep newbies into the community or get newbies to want to branch out and start getting different actions or different styles or different calibers or whatever and really get to find out what they like and what they don't like. And I know there's lots of new people in the gun community and they go on YouTube and they watch shows like this and and videos and stuff like that. There's a lot of good information out there, but equally, there's a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of people wearing tight T-shirts with goatees and shaved heads, calling themselves operators that just got their NRA training certificate last year, going out telling you (laughs) that the way you're doing it is wrong because you're not doing it their way because they're the only expert. And it's kind of like you've got to figure it out. You can you can take what these people tell you. You can take the advice we give you. But when you go out to the range, if it doesn't work for you, find your own way. But don't let any of that push you away from the firearms community. Well, it now, might does be... anybody else? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK, I was just going to say, does anybody else think possibly part of the part of the fear, you know, people that especially when they're when they're newbies to shooting guns and stuff part of the fear of that external safety um you know and and hey i I don't want to have to worry about taking that safety off does any of that go back to hollywood how many movies or tv shows have we seen where somebody you know picks up a gun points it at the bad guy it won't go off and the bad guy laughs (laughs) haha you don't know how to take the safety off the gun you know i mean how many people just subliminally even think well, I don't want a gun with the safety just in case I ever have to actually use it, you know? Yeah. I was watching this one guy. This was years ago. I can't remember who the director was, but it was one of the top directors of the violence type of movies. And he said that he's got that question all the time. When the when the good guy comes through the door, he racks the shotgun. You hear that. And they're like, well, why didn't, if you're going into a house where all the bad guys are, why wasn't your gun already loaded? Why wasn't it already ready? And he said, he reacts it whenever he changes rooms too. Yeah. With that, <laughs> the, the director said that sound is what the audience wants to hear. You know, it doesn't matter how real it is or whatever, it's, but when, you, they, when you're yeah, on a big it's, screen it's, movie and you hear, that's the same. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Check this every, out. Check this out. Every, how about a movie where they're firing percussion revolvers and brass cases are hitting the ground? A, there's no brass case with a percussion revolver, and B, revolvers don't inject brass cases. Well, yeah. that's the, that's the yeah. point that he was making. The reality of it doesn't matter when you're in a movie well, because you want the effect for the crowd that's on, watching. Uh, on the on same reason why they must have bottom port ejection because the dust cover is always closed on the ARs and they're firing. Yet there's no brass coming out of the gun, but they shoot. And the back sights are down. <laughs> Go ahead. The other thing that I wanted no. to mention is, and, and it might not be good etiquette to talk mm-hmm. about it this way, but where are you putting your sh- shots? You know, are you, and, and once again, I apologize to everybody listening and everybody on the panel if it's not supposed to be brought out this way. Are you killing someone or are you wounding someone? And if, you're, mm-hmm. if your intention when somebody's someone. in your house is to put a bullet through their head, any bullet on the market will do that. You know, and then you can watch all the videos on YouTube or wherever with the self defense and, and police shooting. There's plenty of big, you know, forty five ACPs and whatever you wanna ever else you wanna add in there that people have been shot with multiple times and don't drop. So just because you've got a forty five and you shoot somebody in the stomach with it doesn't mean they're out of the fight. No, that's right. Well, uh, that's yeah, why so, People that if you know got what a 380, about. If, if you got a 380 and someone's in your house and you put one between their eyes, that 380 was good enough. Yeah. Yep. Indeed. You make a great point. <clears throat> food for thought. I, I'm. If you're trying to stop somebody entering your house, you don't ever shoot to kill or shoot to wound. You shoot to stop. Well, yeah, but what does that mean? What does like? I'm not trying. I'm not trying to like argue. I'm actually asking the question. Like, what does that mean to the panel? Shoot to stop. That's kind of what I was uh, talking about. Is what do you mean by stop? stop? Am I shooting you in the stomach, or am you, I shooting you in the face? Shoot, shoot, shoot until they stop. That means until they stop moving. If if they're well, one shot with... in the face will stop anybody. Yep, it, it, it will. That's but but you, here's the thing: in a high stress situation. The, it's just like we went back to talking about this a couple of weeks ago with deer. Do you shoot for the chest or do you shoot for the head of the deer? 
Well, the bad guy's head can be moving around, and it's a lot smaller target than center mass. Mm-hmm. Center mass. Now is I have I have a little bit of a. Size. My my house is set up to. There's a bunch of hallways, so when it's a split foyer, so when you come up or down the steps, you're entering a hallway. If you go back to the bedrooms, you're entering hallways. If you come down into the basement, you're entering hallways. So if I step out into my hallway, you can move all you want. You're not going very far. I'm hitting you with a lethal shot every time. If I'm at Walmart and the bad guy starts going crazy, I can understand a head's a small target where center mass is a lot easier to hit. But if you're in my house... It it goes back to the high stress situation. I mean, how many times have you have you heard the stories of, you know, somebody emptied an entire magazine down the hallway at somebody and hit them once or hit them because not at they all. Stopped. Uh, police do it all the time. Well, because because they stopped or because the the, you know, the homeowner missed or whatever because in this time of stress, you know, all the training goes out the window and they forgot to line their sights up and they just pointed it. And that's shot. why you need to, you need more practice. Maybe you need more training. I hate to say that because I'm a big advocate of, I, I'm, I'm not into the whole, tra- but a lot of people are in training to sell training. They're not in the training to help make you better or to give you skills that you could use. They're in the business to make money. It's not about you. And I, I so I'm, I'm a big advocate against train or at least making it mandatory or some, some of these people are selling garbage out there. But the thing is though, I'm not saying that every time you pull the trigger, you're going to hit center mass and that's going to do it. But when the guy is six feet away and you've got to put 17 rounds into him to put him down, you might want to consider your level (laughs) of skill. Stress or no stress. I I would agree. You can't handle that firearm under stress. I don't know if I really want you wearing a badge and being behind that firearm because I had to learn how to use a firearm under stress it's not easy, but it is it is doable. I, the biggest I, I would thing agree, is practice. But... I think practice is better than training because the shoot your shooting skills are are uh, what they call a perishable skill, right? Right. So if you don't practice enough, you will lose that skill, and then it's harder to get back up on it. And it's like going back to the gym after you've been away for a while. You know what I mean? So one of the things that one of the things that I think people misunderstand is what a cop is. Because I know around here we've got state police, we've got sheriffs, and then we have, you know, local town cops. If you want to be a state cop, it's a rigorous deal to get into become a state cop. Same thing with a sheriff's deputy. If you go to Baltimore City, you can fill out an application and become a cop off the street. So just because they have a badge one doesn't mean that they're expert marksmen. Well, well and that's, and that's the biggest thing. Cops that people don't think about is cops are reactionary. They react to the crime after it freaking happens. They're not right. preventing too much. Right. But in, in, let me preface this with saying I am a hundred percent behind, behind law enforcement. I, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled with cops and, and, and I, I don't have a problem with them at all. Even when they're doing their job, if they pull me over, it's because I deserved it, you know? So, so I am a hundred percent behind cops and I'm not trying to say anything bad about anybody but a lot of cops are not gun people. You know, well, that's kind of what my point was. Right. Baltimore City is such a dangerous place. When why would I become a Baltimore City cop and put my life on the line all day, every day, and my family's life on the line when I could just be a county sheriff and, you know, serve summonses? And I'm not, please don't, don't misunderstand. Any cop who puts a uniform on, his life or her life is in danger at all times. But. Sure. There's a definite difference between I've got two choices. I can be a a county cop or I can go into Baltimore City and be a cop. You know, the good cops, unless you, you know, most of them are going to want to stay alive because they got families and I can get paid better being a county sheriff than I can being an inner city Baltimore cop and get shot at every day. But when you take on that responsibility, that's what you do. You take on that responsibility. I don't want to see any of them get hurt or killed. But you're doing a job where every single day you could get hurt or killed. If you're not willing to take on that responsibility, don't join the law enforcement agency. The same thing with the military. If you're not willing to go overseas and die for your country, don't join the military. Don't think just because you're a cook, you're not going to see any action or you're not going to risk your life. It's, I, it's a I choice. Agree. I was about it's to not, say the same thing. You're not being forced into it. It's a choice you make. Live with your choice or don't make that choice at all. Right, how but many, there's a lot of them who it's just a job. 
Well, then I don't want them out there City doing a, a job like that because they're not going to give us the best service. It's the same That's thing with owning a firearm or, or keeping a loaded gun in your nightstand in case you do have to use it in the middle of the night. If you can't employ that under a stressful situation without having collateral damage or, or making a bad judgment call or you just bought the thing and you don't even know how to use it or whatever – this is another choice, and it's a choice that it has a lot of responsibility on it. It's a heavy weight. Make the choice and be responsible or stay out of it. There are some people I have met that have been interested in having a gun, and I've advised them to get a dog for self-defense because <laughs> I don't want this guy with I'm serious. It's that bad. It's that They're, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot or kill their kids. It's, it's that bad. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, I don't want to. I want to cut you early. I'm. I want to go ahead and end the chat, guys. I'm going to go ahead and get moving here. I've got some stuff going on in family that's going to be here shortly, so we're going to go ahead. And go ahead and call it. I'm. I'm sorry, Tony. I apologize, guys. Um, guys, I do want to thank you, you for joining us today. Several hour after chat, crying out loud. <laughs> well, we could have last week. Today, I don't have that time, unfortunately. But uh, anyway, guys, got to shut her down. So I want to thank you guys for joining us today. I want to thank the panel for being here. Let's see who is with us today. Sketchy Roll on the on the YouTube side. Vanessa Kitty, Blue Steel 44. Uh, Black Cat Outdoors was there. Rich White was out there. Good good conversation going over in the chat today. Lots of good stuff. A lot of funny stuff. A lot of serious stuff. Stephen Dawkins was with us. Nate2099. WB with us. Jorge Cortez in the house. Vanessa Kitty. Let's see. Clover Tack was here for a little while. Hello, Clover Tack. Uh, Black Cat Outdoors. Clover's probably still with us. Uh, let's see here. George Trucker was with us also. Uh, Midnight Range, obviously joining in. And Dog Dad, thank you for the super chat. I do appreciate that. Hopefully we gave you some advice. Uh, Dog Dad had mentioned it was a post-2013 LCP that he was looking at getting. Uh, so, again, we would just say pass. Calaveras 32 special out there. 04 Emmy in the house, as usual. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody. Scott, P79, on your, you're out there too. So that's it, guys. Thanks for joining us. And then over on the Gun Channel side, we had uh, Patrick out there in Paper Plane Crash joining us today. And for the panel, I'll let you guys go ahead and put a little final plug in there, and then we'll go ahead and call it. I don't know about the topics for next week. I'll go look and see what's uh, what people have suggested. I'm still pulling suggestions for our, the uh, last subscriber giveaway that I gave away. So this time, let's go ahead and start over on the left side. Uh, David, anything you want to mention before we go? Yeah, I appreciate the invite. Always a good yeah. conversation. Uh, yeah. You guys can go check out my channel if you want to see some not-so-great videos. Uh, don't forget to check out guntube.org. Don't forget to check out the rest of Travis's channel. Some really great content there. Thanks, and man. be sure to tune in Tuesday nights to 2A Tuesdays. Awesome. Awesome. Heck yeah, man. There's a lot of good content out there. Get over, go over to gunchannels.com. Get yourself a membership. Get over to guntube.org. Uh, get a membership over there and post some content. Have fun with it, right? Cool. Thanks, cool. All right. Nice strike. Anything you want to say before we call it, bud? Well, I don't know. You just plug guntube.org. I'm not sure I should plug it again. How about, how about some infringement of our rights going on right now? What do you think about that? Uh, shut up, be infringed. Woo, nice and early. I'm awake now. Thank you. Right. Better right. than you, coffee, man. you have a plug Woo. to Hatfield's company. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't have to plug Palmetto State Armory because you know I do that all the time anyway. So because they already uh, sponsored him, that's how he got his there. cousin in there. Nice tricks yeah. in the pockets of big PSA. No, no. <laughs> Actually, the they're in PSA. they're in their they're in your pocketbook. Is that right? They're in your pockets, taking your money from you. So well, they're, they're uh, taking my money. Yeah, yeah. It's the other but, way around. We don't have sponsorships. We no. sponsor them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, cool. uh, you yeah, know what? Man. Check us out. Me and Travis do this other podcast every Tuesday nights, nine o'clock. Eight o'clock central. Nine, nine o'clock Eastern. Hey, eight o'clock central. Drag central. central. It, 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 it's called it's called hit or miss. So check that out. And again, go to guntube.org. Check out the uh, the advertisement banners because they help guntube make money. So nice strike isn't always broke. There we go. There because we go. guntube is taking up all my damn money. That's right. That's right. Oh, you're gonna be always broke anyways. Don't go there. Oh man, come on, come on. He's he's got he's got he's got a whole website to support, man. Give it give 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 the give the guy a break. Remember, if you do buy stuff, go through guntube.org, click on the links because of the affiliate uh cut that can go back to the channel or to the website. Make sure you guys do that if you buy from Brian Ells or PSA. All right, Sand Hills, any closing remarks before we call, bud? Uh yeah, thanks for uh, letting me join up today. Cool. And just like uh, David had said, two A Tuesdays. Nine o'clock Central Time Tuesday nights, so you can check that out on the Sand Hill Shooter channel. Um, also, you can 
always find great stuff on everybody's channel that's in here. Um, as far as uh, not very good videos or low quality videos, David, I've got more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> but you can oh, always on, count. You're putting content out there, which is a lot more than a lot of other channels. <laughs> you used to put content out on YouTube, right? You, you can always count on this crowd for some discount shenanigans. So, <laughs> so there you go. But uh, but yeah, check us out. Um, I think that uh, I think what we're going to talk about this week on Two A Tuesday is going to be uh, that uh, freedom isn't safe and safety isn't free. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. There's a huge cost all the way around when you think about it. All right. Squibby, anything you want to say before we go, man? Uh, as usual, thanks for the invite. I really yeah. enjoy doing these shows. I, I think I kind of took us down a rabbit hole again. It's, Dude, I do it doesn't that matter. It, it's all good gun chat. You know, the whole idea is uh, we're here to talk guns and, and, and that's, you know, what other stuff comes up. Great. Other stuff pops up, whether oh. it's guns or politics. You know, it's all relevant. It doesn't matter in the end. We have no real, you know, set agenda other than just a few topics to cover. So, yeah. Okay. Well, add to the list of future topics, responsibility with a firearm, maybe, or the, 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 uh, the responsibility you bear, whether you do it for a living, where you carry a gun for a living, or whether you have a gun mm -hmm. as a private citizen, maybe. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, we had a good conversation this morning, as usual. Uh, yeah. Good show, as usual. And um, just looking forward to the next one. Uh, I've got a channel. Uh, I've got lame videos, too. Um, <laughs> squib load, two separate words. I don't know. I, I, was at the, I was at the gun store last week, and I asked if I could shoot some video footage. And they said, yeah. And then the owner come out, and he goes, what's this guy taking footage for? And they go, oh, he's going to put us on YouTube. And he goes, oh, what's the name of your channel? Right, so I told him. He scrolled down three pages before they found the channel. He goes, "Oh yeah, here you are, way at the bottom." So you should have you know, told Travis P. Eleven, man. I'm way. Uh, you know what? I I'm actually did that at I was I did that at a store in Las Vegas where I you know I said I was on YouTube and <laughs> yeah. like, well, how many followers do you have? It's like uh, not even a hundred. But I but I go on this show on Saturdays where this guy's got ten thousand followers. <laughs> Hey, for a short period of time, my Glock G45 video was right after Hickok, number three spot. So there you go. My one popped uh, up on the YouTube searches. I thought if, that was kind of cool. If I'm in a gun store and they're okay with me filming or whatever, then I give them my name. But uh, if I'm filming and they, they come out and they're mad and they want to know what the channel is, then I tell them Travis Peeler. Well, go go message Travis. Is that where all that hate's coming from? I get some weird <laughs> yes. negative comments. Sandhill's going people. around all these God. gun stores and yeah, he using your so name in vain. With stuff. It's ridiculous sometimes. I'm pretty much just begging everything. them for free stuff for my channel. And if they get mad because I'm I begging know. for free stuff, then I tell them it's Travis P11. So. We, need, we need to do my top 10 negative comments video <laughs> you guys would be amazed at the stuff that i that Did i you get people your... yell at me because the stuff sitting in the background in my kitchen it's like really you're mad about the color of my salt and pepper shakers it's like <laughs> i've got a two thousand dollar christensen arms rifle sitting on the tabletop and you're upset because i've got uh, a fiesta oh, right. dish sitting in the sink man you need nice. my life, bro <laughs> i don't care about honest criticism but some of the stuff i get criticized for is just nuts man I've got your yeah, well, it's like, it's yeah, like I mean, when I sent you that one about the flag being backwards, and as I press send, I'm going, <laughs> wait a minute. The laptop camera shoots everything <laughs> backwards, and I had already yeah. hit send, and like, ah, oh, what an a hole I am. So yes, yeah, yeah the posters are all backwards too, <laughs> hanging up in my in my room. You know, all the text was backwards too, but that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Did you check in my latest video? I'm at Dust I'm at Dusty's yeah. farm, and I uh I, I do not shoot his chronograph, but uh uh, I, I've got some other stuff in the works. It's just making time to get some stuff out there. But I, I enjoy sure doing the shows time, more than making mean. the videos. Yeah, What's no, that? David, I, I do. I did you get my thumbs up on this, this video. Time, you mean. All right. I got my one. I got a person. If you guys look at the thumbs up and thumbs down, I traditionally have one thumbs down on almost every single video I've ever done, except for giveaways and charity videos. And, and two-way conference videos. Everything else, thumbs down, thumbs down, thumbs down. Whatever. That's because Man. those are the only ones I like. Yeah, we there, need to thank check you. Out. Thank well, you. There you Travis, go. At, right. Travis, at least one of your caliber corners didn't get more more thumbs down than it actually got views. Well, that was kind of orchestrated. I think we made that happen. I think it was kind of a hey, joking situation just, that just got out of control. So <laughs> I'm just glad you took down the one where I was wearing a robe in front of the reload bench. <laughs> oh, that was over. 
<laughs> no squibs. But first of all, the reloading video. I got up late that about. day. I was running to the damn phone to get on the hangout. <laughs> if you're interested in seeing squib in a shorty robe, head on over to gunsoup.org and watch Caliber Corner or something about reloading. There's all the reloading episodes are over there. You're still there. It's still there. I took the reloading videos. I took the reloading videos off YouTube. Uh, so I wouldn't get nailed for them. I put them over on GunTube.org. Uh, I'm going to download a whole bunch of stuff on the GunTube to take the whole damn site down now. Oh, God damn it. Uh, all right, all right, all right. So moving on. Uh, let's see. Tony, any final words of wisdom for all these uh, little pranksters that we have in the panel today? All this all this riffraff and all these shenanigans? Not for the panel, but I will oh. yeah. address the safety issue. Yes. And the... The fact whether a gun has a safety externally or not is not the issue that makes it safe. Yeah. It's the person who handles it. So yes. Whichever way you go, and I carry a gun either way. I don't, it don't matter to me. Uh, you know, that's entirely up to you and your training whether you feel the need for a safety or not. You don't hear of Glock owners shooting themselves every day because the gun doesn't have a safety. Yeah, yeah. No, man, I, I hear you. I mean, it does depend on the user, and you can safely carry it and use it. And, and you know, your, your choice of holster can have an effect on whether or not you'd have to worry about that that safety coming on or coming off. And just train with it. Train with it to disengage it and check to make sure it's disengaged when you draw it. Because if you train enough with it, that'll just be a habit that'll occur if you ever have to draw and fire, you know? So you're, you're just, you're going to remind me how hard to do it anyway. Yeah, that, I mean, again, that's, that's, that's what I did for my war weapon. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. So that's it. This has been Caliber Corner episode number 61, where today we talked about love and lever guns, uh, custom versus stock pistols, and uh, where to put that firearm when nature calls. So uh, there you go. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you had a great time. Thanks for hanging out. It's always good to have you come in on a Saturday morning. Uh, Scott P79 said, look at that. I just changed my oil in my car. Yeah, it's amazing what you can get done. I When I first started listening to podcasts, when I listened to the Daily Gun Show and Early Watch, I was working on the house that we live in. I was doing painting and doing some, you know, some mild furniture work and stuff. And uh, it was amazing what I could get done after listening to a podcast. So it was good stuff. Now we know why you like the early watch because you're high on paint fumes. Oh. <laughs> Man, exactly what it was. No, I opened the windows. It was rough because it was December, but I. That, yeah, no, I was not, but it, it could be, I know exactly what you're saying, man. Yeah, some of that stuff, that, some of the primers and stuff that I used, oh, nasty, nasty. So, all right, guys, I will talk to you later. We'll see everybody next week, uh, 8 a.m. Central Time, the time that the world revolves around. And uh, we'll bring you back with Caliber Corner number 62. I try to post the episode like on Monday or Tuesday night so you guys know what the topics are going to be. Uh, make sure that you hit the bell to subscribe. Uh, and it'll give you the notifications when we go live. And that's it, guys. So we will talk to you later. What's up? What's up? I will probably not be here next Saturday. Okay. That's a Buffalo shoot. Oh, nice. Nice. Okay. Cool. What is cool. It? What is it? Adios, Felicia. Adios, Felicia. Damn. Alpha <laughs> Mike Foxtrot. Shut up, me infringed. If Bye, you wouldn't mind, Bye, Felicia. Felicia. Adios, Alicia. Please, Felicia. Please, please. <laughs> Felicia, please go. Leave now. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Take care and have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Well.